we take you live to Olympic Stadium in Montreal and our Grey Cup sports crew. Live from high atop Montreal's Olympic Stadium, it is Grey Cup 85. It all began six months ago, and after 72 regular season and four playoff games, football fans are truly at a fever pitch. The jewel of the Belle Provence, Montreal, glowing from a week of Grey Cup festivities, is ready. As all the preparations, color, and excitement build towards the reason why everyone is here, it's 60 minutes of football to determine the 1985 CFL champion. The Western champion British Columbia Lions and the Eastern champion Hamilton Tiger Cats roar into the 73rd championship of Canadian professional football. And we look live from our camera position in the tower of the north end of Olympic Stadium on this Grey Cup Sunday. Hello again everyone, I'm Brian Williams. Welcome back to Montreal. Just under 30 minutes to kick off to set the stage for the Lions and Ticats, our play-by-play -play announcers from CBC, Don Whitman, and from CTV, Pat Marsden. Thank you, Brian, and it's always a pleasure to join forces with you, Pat Marsden, and the other members of your CTV telecast crew. You know, much has been written and said about Grey Cup 85. It's been thoroughly analyzed and dissected. But we're going to put our analysts on the spot and have them, over the next few minutes, take a really close look at the two teams. Well, Don, let me first of all say hello to everybody across Canada and say to you, it's always a pleasure being with you. And before we put our commentators to work, let's you and I decide on a scale of 1 to 10 what the festivities have been like. I think that last night's Grey Cup dinner and most of the things that have happened in Montreal really rate a 10. I'd have to agree with you, Pat, although I haven't been quite as active as you have. <laughs> well, we are now going to join two of the most knowledgeable people in Canada when it comes to analyzing quarterbacks, receivers, running backs. I'm talking about Leif Pedersen and Ronnie Lancaster. They're going to grade out all these people for you on a scale 1 to 10. Okay, guys, you know when you talk offense, you have to start at that quarterback position. How about Ken Hobart? Well, Ronnie, you know, he's only a 48% passer on the season, but I don't think that's indicative of his abilities. He was the outstanding rusher, third in the league this year. He got the job done. Well, that's the big They said he couldn't throw. All he does is throw the Concord right out of Iverwind Stadium last week. Other side of the ball, though, Roy DeWalt is a passer, and his stats will back that up. Well, he's a classic-style quarterback. Only 12 interceptions on the season, 27 touchdown passes, an impressive ratio. He's a guy that won't beat himself. How do you rate him? Well, I give both quarterbacks an eight. Nine, seven. I give the Walt the edge for experience. All right, let's look at the running backs. Johnny Shepard could be a key for Hamilton. Well, he really could. You know, in 1983, he was the Shinley outstanding rookie, but really, in the last couple of seasons, he's been an unknown quantity. Injuries have really bothered him, so I really don't know what to expect from him this afternoon. I know what the Ticats expect. They expect at least one big play. They feel they have to have a big play from Johnny Shepard today. He's a guy that can do it. The BC Lions with two running backs. John Henry White is a blocker, but Freddie Sims, third game this year, and what a year he had, or a game he had against the Bombers last week. Unbelievable. Yeah, I give... Hamilton a 6 and BC an 8 because of Freddie Sims. Well, I'm going to go 9-7 and again because of John Henry White as a blocker. The receivers, Leaf, this is your area. This is what you like to talk about. What do you want to know? Well, you know, Ronnie, anytime I look at a receiving core, I ask myself, do they have a threat? Well, BC and Hamilton both have threats. How about Steve Stapler? In 1985, every four times he touched the football, he scored a touchdown. He can get the job done. And last week, Ned Armour filling in for Murph Fernandez. Well, what about him? Well, I know this. I don't think anybody in the, in the country was expecting Ned Armour to come up and catch six passes, one for a touchdown, and only have the best game of his career in the biggest game of the season, the West End Final. Let's rate the receivers. All right, I'm going to give Hamilton a 7, BC a 9. I'll agree with you. I'll go 9-7 and BC a little bit of edge for experience. But I know this. Let's go over and hear how the guys play up front on the offensive line with Leo Cahill and Frank Rigney. Well, thanks very much, guys. You know, we've heard all about the pass catchers, the guys that run with it, and the guys that throw it. But, Leo, let's talk about the guys that are really important on offense, those guys that make it all happen up front, the offensive line. Tell me about the Ticats. Well, Frank, as far as I'm concerned, the Ticats are kind of nondescript. They're not exactly household names. Take, for example, Marv Alamang, their offensive tackle. At the beginning of the season this year, he was moved to that all-important offensive center position. And, you know, take a look at the other side of the line, Al Wilson. He's been at that center position for 14 years. That'll tell you something about these two teams. Another thing, they're very difficult to grade. In other words, Hobart is a mover, and their offensive line never knows where he is. And for an offensive line, that's a handicap. But whatever they're doing, they're doing it well. And if they can get by this one more game, they're going to be drinking from that great cup, Frank. 
Well, Leo, I'll tell you something. When you look at the BC Lions offensive line, they have been a group that's been together for a long time. Almost nine years of CFL experience. On average, they average 30 years old as well, and three of them are 280 pounds or bigger. I disagree a little bit, Leo, in that I think a drop-back quarterback where you know where he's going to be creates some problems also for an offensive line. They need somebody to take off a little bit with that football. Freddie Sims provided that for them in the final game against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, gaining over 100 yards, and I think that's really key today. BC's offensive line needs to be able to run the football, but if I was going to grade them on a scale from 1 to 10, I'd give BC 8 and the Hamilton Ticats 6. How about yourself? Well, as much as I hate to agree with you, Frank, I'd have to go the same way. 8 for BC, 6 for Hamilton. Yeah. Thanks, Leo. Let's go to Don and Pat. And Pat, somehow I think we knew they were going to, I'm talking about Leo and Frank, rate the offensive line the most important players in the game. Yeah, but I think there's a point that should be made here that if this rating system had been done about eight or nine weeks ago, Hamilton would have had a lot of twos and threes. Let's take a look at exactly how these people were rated by our commentators. As you can see, the BC Lions are really going to come out heavy here because the quarterback rated by Ronnie Lancaster at a nine and Ken Hobart as an eight. And in running backs, an 8-6 discrepancy. Lee Pedersen favoring Hamilton, and Ron Lancaster favors BC. And the receivers, the two of them agree as to how the receivers should be rated. And we're going to continue with our rating system on this 1985 Grey Cup game. Grey Cup 85 from Olympic Stadium in Montreal. Second consecutive year for the Hamilton Tiger Cats in a Grey Cup game for the British Columbia Lions. It's been two years since they played in the Grey Cup game, but in the dressing room of the two teams, I'm sure some very anxious moments in these final minutes before the actual kickoff. I think that more people are anxious, more so than the players sitting in the stands. Let's go back to Ronnie and Leaf. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Ron, there's no question that both the BC Lions and the Hamilton Tiger Cats definitely take different approaches to how they cover the passing game. Especially at the linebacker position. The BC Lions sometimes, they're always blitzing somebody and they'll bring all of them at times. So a lot of the times they aren't even involved in pass coverage. Yeah, well, Glenn Jackson, Kevin Corner, they've got two guys that can really play one-on-one -on -one coverage. On the other end, Hamilton's linebackers, Leo Ezrins, Ben Zambiazzi, and Greg Gary, they like to sit back in that deep zone coverage. Well, they sure do. If you'll notice during the game, they will be four yards off the ball a lot of the time. That allows them to get deep and force the quarterback into mistakes. Let's rate the linebackers. Oh, listen, I've got to give them both a nine. They're outstanding groups. I'm going to give Hamilton an edge nine, eight. I like those tight cat linebackers. Well, secondaries, they both are distinctive as well because one plays a lot of man and the other one plays a lot of zone. Hamilton this year in that zone coverage set a new 1985 CFL record with 46 interceptions. And they had both of the leaders. Let's face it, Paul Bennett and Les Brown led the league in interceptions. They sit deep force the quarterback to make mistakes. They bend and don't break. BC, though, shuts you down. Well, they really do. They're a reckless group. They play a lot of man-to-man -man coverage, puts a lot of pressure on their players, but they always seem to arise to the occasion. You know what that tells me? You can play defense using different approaches as long as you get the job done as the end result. It all comes down to philosophy. The only philosophy both these clubs have today is win. Let's rate the defensive backs. I give them both a nine again. I'm going Hamilton again, nine, eight, because they set an interception record. Let's go see how the defensive line play their games today with Frank and Leo. Well, thanks again, guys. Two really great defensive football teams out there today. We knew you'd talk a lot about the interceptions they had in 1985, but we really think that the pressure by that front seven has caused most of those interceptions. Leo Hamilton was able to put that pressure on with a very basic defense. Over in Hamilton, they call it guts football, and what they did all year long was send four people, and those four people got there. Now, when you send a front four and they get there all year with consistency, that lets your linebackers get back there a little bit, analyze things, look around, play the pass, and recover to the run, and that's a big advantage. Number 77, Grover Covington, he got 16 sacks this year to lead the CFL. He was outstanding all year long. As long as they can get to that passer with that kind of frequency, they're helping the linebackers out there making a real game. But Frank, you know, early in the season, I thought that the uh, Hamilton Tiger Cats won most of their games due to that great defense. That's very true, Leo, but let's don't forget the BC Lions. They've been consistent all year long, particularly on defense. They led the entire Canadian Football League in quarterback sacks, and they also led in average against the run. So they basically do everything, and they do it with everybody. They'll bring linebackers from all over the place. They have seven people that are almost interchangeable. 
James Parker is more often than not the guy that gets there, but they actually can get pressure from any of the down four linemen or the linebackers. I want to rate these two football teams. I would say the defensive line against the run has a big edge for BC, and because of that, I give them a 9-6 edge over Hamilton. Well, BC has that great quickness in their defensive line. You're right. I'd give them a 9 too, but I like Hamilton's toughness. I'd give them a 9 also. If we look at the linebackers, and they are used quite differently, Leo, I'd still give a slight edge to BC, although Zambiazzi is really great. I'd give BC a 9-8. Well, I like Zambiazzi too, and I think I'd give Hamilton the 8, and I'd give BC the 7. All right, let's talk about the last phase of the ball game that really hasn't been discussed at any great length. What about the kicking game? Any big edge? Well, Frank, I've never seen two better kickers. And they've won a lot of games for both teams this year also, so I'd have to give both kicking games a, a nine. All right, I think I'll agree with you, Leo, for the first time. Oh, nice. But if we turn to the return game, I'm going to give the BC Lions a huge edge. Even though Paul Bennett has the career record returning punts, Clark Darnell Clash can break open football games. I give BC a 10-5 edge. I'm not too sure it's not the best return team I've ever seen with BC. I'd have to give them a 10. I like Hamilton, but they've got to be a 7. Great team speed. Let's go to Pat and Don. When I'm now convinced these guys took too many hits in the head, I'll guarantee you that. All I know is the BC Lions won 13 games, lost only three. The other guys were 8-8. Eight and eight. But anyway, let's take a look at the statistical story. Well, uh, they rate the defensive backs fairly even. Same with the linebackers. Hamilton did have an outstanding defensive team this year. But one of the reasons I think, Pat, is that they rate the team so evenly is that the Hamilton Tiger Cats earlier in the year had a record of 1-7. and seven. They finished the year at 8-8 eight and eight in the second half of the season, perhaps one of the best teams in the entire league. Well, they also won eight of their last ten games, and all eight victories were against the Eastern Conference. Let's not forget that. But anyway, as we continue to show you how these clubs are rated, you see that the BC Lions are given an edge. Yes, in our Grey Cup report card by the analysts, 182 for the BC Lions, 153 for the Hamilton Tiger Cats. They're getting closer to kickoff, and this is Grey Cup 85 from Olympic Stadium in Montreal. Welcome back to Montreal's Olympic Stadium. I'm Brian Williams. About 15 minutes to kick off uh, the BC Lions and the Ticats meeting for only the third time in Grey Cup history. While we have a minute, let's introduce you to today's game officials. I'm Jake Ireland from Jarvis, Ontario, and I'll be the referee for today's Grey Cup game. The other members of the officiating crew are Chuck Paul, umpire, head linesman Ken Lazaruk, Line Judge, Art McAvoy. Back Judge, Bob Bryan. Field Judge, George Black. Standby Referee, Warren Woods. And Standby Official, Bud Steen. The officials in charge of today's game, the players will be introduced in just a moment, and I'm sure as they stand down in those runways, Pat, they are very nervous as the public address announcer gets set to introduce them. Amateurs de football, football fans. Voici maintenant les joueurs partant à l'attaque pour les champions de l'Est. We are now introducing the starting offensive lineup of the Eastern Division champions, les Tiger Cats de Hamilton. Au centre, at center, le numéro 63, number 63, Marvin Alamay. Garde à gauche, left guard, numéro 60, 58, number 58, Jason Riley. Le garde à droite, right guard, numéro 53, number 53, Jeff Hart. Bloqueur à gauche, left tackle, numéro 68, number 68, Mike Dirks. Bloqueur à droite, right tackle, numéro 67, number 67, 
Ralph Scholes. Eddie Espace, wide receiver, numéro 3, number 3, Steve Stapler. Eddie Espace, wide receiver, numéro 75, number 75, Ron Ingram. Demi Serre, slot back, numéro 21, number 21, Rufus Crawford. Demi Serre, slot back, numéro 23, number 23, Rocky Di Pietro. Demi, running back, numéro 19, number 19, Johnny Shepard. Centre arrière, fullback, numéro 74, number 74, Steve Jackson. Et le quart, quarterback, numéro 4, number 4, Ken Omar. L'entraîneur chef, the head coach, Al Bruno. Ses adjoints, the assistant coaches, and the rest of the Hamilton Tiger Cats. And what a job Al Bruno has done with the Hamilton Tiger Cats since replacing Bud Riley late in the 1983 season. That year he got the Tie Cats to the Eastern Conference Final. They lost on a controversial call to Toronto. Last year to the Grey Cup game, losing to Winnipeg. Al Bruno and company hope to win it all this year in Grey Cup 85. Now, let's meet the BC Lions. Placard à gauche, left tackle, numéro 90, number 90, Rick Klassen. Lecker à droite, right tackle, numéro 77, number 77, by Gray. Elie à droite, right hand, numéro 40, number 40, James Parker. Secondaire à gauche, left linebacker, numéro 31, number 31, Kevin Bonar. Secondaire à gauche, middle linebacker, numéro 91, number 91, Tyrone Cruz. Let's go, let's go. Secondaire à droite, right linebacker, numéro 37, number 37, Glenn Jackson. Demi droite à gauche, left cornerback, numéro 1, number 1, Darnell Clash. Demi à gauche, left halfback, numéro 28, number 28, Larry Crawford. Marauder, safety, numéro 4, number 4, Nelson Martin. Demi à gauche, right halfback, numéro 10, number 10, Melvin Bird. Demi de Moore à droite, right cornerback, numéro 18, number 18, Key Gouge. Ses adjoints, les assistants coaches et les autres joueurs des Lions de la Colombie-Britannique. Well, there's no question about it that Donnie Matthews, as the head coach of the BC Lions for three years, has done an outstanding job. 
three first place finishes and now he hopes the culmination of it all let's go down and meet our sideline commentators steve armitage and bill stevenson <laughs> well let me tell you steve we came dressed for the weather i thought it was going to be montreal style weather for the gray cup you're a typical vancouver right you thought it was going to rain and you know something you're not out of place at all it's beautiful up until about 20 minutes ago i had a great big fur on i was sweating in that fur so i went inside and put on my typical vancouver overcoat what it's a, a beautiful day it is steve and i will be covering the two benches and you know in covering the benches, they're as contrasting as the head coaches. Al Bruno is one of the most laid-back head coaches in all of football. Now, your other fellow may be just a little tight. Don Matthews can be very testy at times, but he's very, very cool. All right, now let's go upstairs for the coin toss. veteran Al Wilson representing the BC Lions in his 14th season he still has not received that cherished Grey Cup ring despite many individual honors that have been accorded him would have been very surprising if Hamilton hadn't elected to receive the kickoff they want to prove that they can move the ball against BC they feel they're as good a football team personally I don't Don I think the BC Lions with a 13 and 3 record have lost only two clubs all year they lost two games to the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and one to Calgary. They were superb in the Western Final. They've got to be the favorite as Doug Mitchell, the commissioner of the Canadian Football League, and an old friend, Otto Jelinek, go to center field for the ceremonial kickoff. It's been a very busy week for Commissioner Doug Mitchell, but a week of relief, I'm sure, with the announcement by Mr. Edmund Ricard on Thursday afternoon that, yes, indeed, the Montreal Concords would be alive and well in the 1986 football and season. And beyond that, he made it very, very clear. We are committed to football in Montreal and to Canada because we think it's a very important thing for this nation. So congratulations to Ed Ricard and to Amasco and to Charles Bronfman. Not a bad job by the Honorable Otto Jelinek in kicking off the ceremonial kickoff down at midfield and right now I think the people and official party are moving into position for the playing of our national anthem. Olympic Stadium in Montreal, the site of Grey Cup 85 in 1981. The Grey Cup game was played here. Was the Ottawa colder. Rough Riders, uh, a team that rated as a definite underdog against the Edmonton Eskimos, but surprised by jumping into a first half lead and then yielded to constant Edmonton pressure in the second half as the Eskimos won the Grey Cup game. And of course, going back to 1977, the story involving the staples that were used by the Montreal team to win a Grey Cup championship on a snow, ice-covered field. Well, let me tell you this much. As we get set for the anthem, and as everybody comes to their feet, this may be the nicest day I've seen in Montreal at this time of the year in the many years I've been coming.
day it's going to be. We've got the big one for you in just a few seconds. This is Great Cup 85 from Olympic Stadium in Montreal. Well, hello again, everybody. I'm Pat Marsden, along with Lee Pedersen and Frank Rigney. We are set to go. This is going to be a good football game. Many people suspecting that the Hamilton Ticats are going to be a lot tougher than many of us have felt. But let's not forget that the BC Lions are winners of 13 games this year, by far the best record in the CFL. And Louis Fasaglia is all set to go. So are Howard Fields and Rufus Crawford. Roy DeWalt looks pretty cool on the sidelines as Fasaglia will kick it out to Rufus Crawford at the 12. Crawford gets it up to about the 28-yard line. Bruce Barnett was there to bring him down. And so Ken Hobart, who plays more like a linebacker than a quarterback, <laughs> but boy, has he been effective in the latter part of this season, comes up to lead the offense. Well, well he's going to do, if he's going to make those defensive linemen keep their line, keep their areas covered when he does take off with that football. Big pressure by BC all year long, but they've got to be concerned about this man's running ability. And he's thrown the ball well in recent weeks. Had 19 touchdowns, 14 interceptions, and that's not shabby for a guy who likes to run. This is Johnny Shepard. <laughs> Shepard with a huge run to the 50-yard line, brought down by Darnell Clash, finally. Well, Pat, you know it was interesting. Ron Lancaster and I mentioned Johnny Shepard in the pregame show, and really an unknown quantity this year. He's been injured the last couple of seasons. Watch the cut he makes to get outside. Gets by Kevin Konar, the linebacker, then he's off and running. The pickup was 22 yards in his first down to Hamilton. The ball up there, 50. Hobart quickly for Rocky Di Pietro, but the pass was underthrown. Tyrone Cruz, the middle linebacker, had slid over to provide the coverage. A little bit surprising right off the bat, a 22-yard gain against the best defensive team against the rush in the CFL. Well, it sure is the way you like to start the football game. I'm sure Don Matthews on the sidelines there is concerned. He knows he's got a tough defense and relying, as you see, number nine, Nick Hebler for the big pass rush. BC Lions were number one in the CFL in sacks. They've got a sack situation right here on second and ten, and they get to the quarterback as Nick Hebler and James Parker. Numbers 99 and 40 were there to bring him down. Now, Pat, you know, I saw Nick Hebler on a newscast last night, and he said that he was going to be working against Ralph Schultz, and he said he was going to eat him up this afternoon. Felt like he could have a great day. Initially, he and Parker meet for the sack. Right? I'll tell you, Leif, it looked like he was being held by Schultz's wall, but it didn't help at all. So after the loss, Bernie Ruoff and the punting unit comes in. Darnell Clash is the lone man back for the BC Lions. He awaits at his 15-yard line. Ruoff's kick, it's a beauty. He's got Clash hemmed in at the sidelines at the 19. And Darnell gets it over the 25 to about the 28-yard line, where Ed Gattavakis, the backup linebacker, number 39, is there to bring him down. But now we're going to take a look at the British Columbia Lions and Roy DeWalt, maybe the most forgotten quarterback in the CFL in 1985 because after all he did throw 27 touchdown passes and only had 12 interceptions and yet he's not an all-star yeah I want to go on record right now and say <laughs> that was a mistake Leaf I don't know if you saw the balloting in his final stages he finished third wow. Tommy Clements finished behind he was Dunnigan. the best in the West this is Sandusky to the wide receiver Sandusky gets it up over the 35 very close to the first down marker at the 37 Donovan Rose the cornerback number 26 on that side was there to bring him down Pat for the first time in history the BC Lions had two receivers over a thousand yards this year Jim Sandusky of course was the second one Merv Fernandez the outstanding player in this country not playing today of course led the league and let's also mention that Key Van Jenkins, who was the number two rusher in all of Canada, is also out of that BC lineup. This is Freddie Sims, and Sims gets it to the 40-yard line for a pickup of just a couple as that front four of the Hamilton Ticats really uh, clamped down on him. Well, Frank, you mentioned how tough it is to run against BC. Hamilton also a very difficult team to run against. That time, number 77, Grover Covington, primarily known as a pass rusher, really made a great play to stop the draw. That'll be a great matchup. Big John Blaine at 6'6", 280, trying to 
protect his quarterback against Covington. A couple of All-Stars getting at it this afternoon. It's second down and eight yards to go. BC from their 40. DeWalt with a lot of time. Now is flushed out of there. And he does not get it as Russ Brown really gives him a good whack as he gets to the sidelines. And as a matter of fact, DeWalt was fortunate to pick up a yard or two at most. Well, after each team picks up their initial first down in the first quarter, their drive stall, you know, Roy DeWalt, only 161 yards rushing this season, really tells you he likes to stay in the pocket and work to his receivers. Well, BC does not want to see Roy DeWalt run with the football. So Louis Pasaglia will be punting on third down and eight yards to go for BC as Rufus Crawford, 21, and Paul Bennett, 27. The outstanding Canadian player in the CFL in 1985 are back to return. And this will be Crawford taking it at his 30. Crawford is brought down as he crosses the 30 to the 31 by Bernie Clear. We're scoreless here at the Olympic Stadium in Montreal. This is Great Cup 85 from the Big O in this metropolis of Montreal, Quebec. Well, this is like the opening minutes of a heavyweight boxing championship. Both guys just feeling each other out. Uh, Hamilton with that effective running play by Johnny Shepard early. Then the Lions came back with a first down gainer by Jim Sandusky. But really, nothing too exciting yet. But now maybe they've seen something as Ken Hobart brings his Hamilton Ticats up over the ball at their own 33-yard line for the first down. Hobart again is grabbed by James Parker. And that is the second sack of the ball game for that BC Lions defense back at the 27-yard line. Well, initially, pretty good time for Ken Hobart to throw the football. Looks like he might be a little shaken up there as he was given some pretty rough treatment from James Parker and Michael Gray. Leaf, we just talked about keeping the leverage, though, keeping Hobart to the inside, keeping your lanes, and they do exactly that. Look at Parker. He tries to go inside a little bit, but he keeps Hobart to the inside, gets help from Gray. They must keep Hobart inside. So it's second down, 14 yards to go on the draw, and John Shepard opens up again for him, and Shepard crosses the 35 to about the 37-yard line, but they're still going to be six yards short of the first down because of the loss on that first down play. Glenn Jackson was there to make the tackle the linebacker, as Al Bruno has got to be saying to himself, listen, if we're going to be effective today, we've got to find some way to let Hobart either throw the ball or get him to the outside. Well, and what they have to do, too, is not find themselves in second and 14 situations against this BC defense. I mean, that's a dangerous kind of place to be in. So on third down and about six yards to go, Bernie Ruoff is back to punt once again. And he doesn't get all of this one. Flash runs up, takes it at his 30-yard line, and now he's back to his 25. Well, that is excellent coverage by the Hamilton Ticats. Wayne Lee forced him back, and actually he ends up losing five yards on the return. Bill Stevenson? There is huge concern, as you can imagine, around Ken Hobart, the coaches, the trainer, Dr. David Levy, and the reason is he hurt his left shoulder. Not severe enough that it's going to keep him out of there, but anytime you get an added injury the way he runs, it has got to be a problem. Well, thank you, Bill, and everybody, of course, keeping their fingers crossed because Hobart is one of the keys to whatever success Hamilton may enjoy here this afternoon. Looking deep is Roy DeWalt, and the pass is caught by Ned Armour, who slips off Les Brown and goes all the way for the touchdown. the kind of formation the BC Lions used all year long to isolate Merv Fernandez one-on-one -on, -one on the cornerback. They put four receivers on the right side of the field and Armour was over there all by himself. You know, Frank, at six foot one, he's got a height advantage over Les Brown and he just took that ball away from him. And great speed, Leaf. That's one thing they do not lose by having Fernandez out of the lineup. Armour can outrun Fernandez, believe it or not. Oh, he's a track star. Flags are down. The point after by Louis Pasaglia is good. But we'll wait for referee Jake Ireland to make his assessment here. 
It's offside against the Hamilton Ticats. The point by Pisaglia is good, and the British Columbia Lions have really struck quickly here against the Hamilton Ticats. They've shocked them, and they lead it 7-0. This is Great Cup 85 from Olympic Stadium in Montreal. You know, it's amazing three out of the four wide receivers in this ballgame are from San Diego State, including that man, Ned Armour, who really provides us with the first huge play of the ballgame. Goes 84 yards on the pass from quarterback Roy DeWalt. The Lions lead at 7 to nothing, and here's their kickoff. Rufus Trotman from the 16. He is Mr. Everything for the Hamilton Ticats. Lucas Grump is finally brought down by Darnell Flash, but he gets the ball up to the 39-yard line. Let's have a look at that touchdown one more time, and really excellent coverage by Les Brown. Ned Arbor just simply took that football away from him. What a big game, of course, he had last week against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Six catches, 137 yards, and the first score of this football game. And when you've got man-to-man -man and the guy doesn't hang on to the ball carrier, it is a touchdown. We saw it happen right there. The pass intended for Ron Ingram was in behind him. It's a tough thing for the Hamilton Tiger Cats. They've really got to try and get a few first downs put together here. They've been scored against. They want to try and establish some momentum. Ken Hobart's been hit hard a couple of times. Just throw that quick pass like he did, but you got to be on target. You know what you've got to say about the BC Lions, too? I mean, let's face it. They suffer injuries to Fernandez and Kevan Jenkins, and they've got people to insert in their lineup, you know, where they don't lose an offense. That's line. right. Bad last week, Freddie Sims gains over 130 yeah. yards. Anybody open, and he is forced out by Tyrone Cruz, the middle linebacker. And so again, the Thai Cats are going to have to turn over the football. Well, that's just uh, simply an outstanding job by Darnell Clash and Larry Crawford on that right defensive secondary side. No running room for Ron Ingram downfield, and finally Ken Hobart, you'll see, is going to run out of room and just take it out of bounds. Well, one of the few times you saw the BC Lions in zone defense is they drop back covering those people. Normally, they'll give you man-to-man -man and really come after your quarterback. Yeah, the problem for Hamilton, once again, second and long. Good punt by Bernie Ruoff. Darnell Clash is back at his 18-yard line. Dan Ovechus is there to bring him down as he crosses the 30 to the 32. But let me say it again in case you've just joined us. This is one of the great days I have ever seen in Montreal at this time of the year. You couldn't ask, fellas, for a better day to play a football game. Pat, there's not a big breeze blowing here at the Big O, but there is a bit of an advantage to the Hamilton and Tide Cats kicking game because there's a couple of areas to our left that are open where the tower is here, and there's a bit of a wind swale comes in there. So if there's an advantage in the kicking game, it belongs to Hamilton in the first 15 minutes. The advantage on the scoreboard right now belongs to BC. They lead it 7 0. They have a first down right now at their 32 yard line. And the give is to Freddie Sims. Sims is tripped up as he gets very close to the 35 yard line by Greg Gary, the linebacker number 41. As Kenny Hobart and head coach Al Bruno talk things over on the sidelines, they know they've got to get that offense moving. Now there's the eight-year veteran from Georgia, Ben Zambiasi. Do you see him fight off Roper. the block of Gerald Roper, the left guard, and he gets in on the play with Greg Gary as well. You know, Roper's 260 pounds, and Ben is 213. Pretty good job by linebacker. Pickup was four yards in second. Six flag is down as they throw the screen to John Henry White. And John Henry is all the way into Hamilton territory at the 48-yard line, but there was a penalty marker on the play. It appeared to be the Hamilton Ticats jumping offside, but we'll see if they were drawn off by a motion call. Well, really set up well, though, by Roy DeWald and his offensive lineman. Get that penetration. Get the lineman out front. You know, John Henry White, over the course of the season, averaged 8.9 Yard, 8.9 yards when he caught the football. That's outstanding for a fullback. He really does it all. If he doesn't run with the football all that much, but a great blocker and an excellent receiver. Had 44 receptions over the course of 1985. Watch a great hustle by Covington. 77. Does not get there, but made the effort. The penalty was against Hamilton. The gain of 26 yards stand as Ned Armour is there once again to make the catch. 
and the touchdown. Donovan Rose providing the defensive coverage. There is a penalty marker at the line of scrimmage. There is another one at the point of the reception. Now let's see what it's about. Well, if you can believe Leo Ezrins, he says it's coming back. Well, they're going to need a rope to get a hold of this guy, Ned Armour, because he's just running wild out there. <laughs> well, they called him for interference on that. They said he gave Donovan Rose a push to make that reception. Jake Ireland's going to sort everything out for us. Don Matthews, he's certainly not happy with that call. Here's the call by referee Jake Ireland. All right, the call is quite simply this. Offside against BC, it was declined. Pass interference is accepted. So move the ball back 10 yards, make it first and 20. BC, the ball at their 51-yard line. DeWalt set up the screen again to John Henry White. Oh, and what a play, a great tackle for the Hamilton Ticats by Mark Streeter, number 20, because John Henry White was just getting in full gear. He was getting set to turn it up for a big game. Well, Riggs, that's what happens when you play that zone defense. And, of course, on first and 20, you know Hamilton's going to be sitting in that kind of coverage. It allows a guy like Mark Streeter, the inside safety, the ability to read the play, see it happen, and then come up and support. He did a super job. Well, Mark Streeter has been around the CFL for four seasons. And this year had a couple of interceptions in that great crew that picked off 46 for Hamilton. The pass over the middle was intended for Freddie Sims. Roy really drilled it in there, and Sims could not hang on. Big old Freddie heard the footsteps there with big Ben Zambiazzi breathing down his neck. Well, after Zambiazzi dropped Roper in his tracks, I guess he could. Well, I don't blame him. So the BC Lions leading at 7 to nothing, send Louis Pasagli and the punting unit onto the field. And the Ticats drop back Paul Bennett, who's been suffering from a hamstring injury. And Rufus Crawford, who was out much of this season with a knee injury, they're both back to return the punts. In this, the most critical game of the year. Crawford has this one bounce in front of him and out of bounds. So the Ticats are going to put it into play at their own 24-yard line. That's where Ken Hobart and the Hamilton offense will have the pigskin when we come back. It's 7-0. BC leads it. This is Great Cup 85 from Olympic Stadium in Montreal. Pat, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of those giving those coins away all the time, all that gold. How come they can't bring some of it up here? I'll tell you, we're talking about over 8000 bucks worth for every one of these players who was selected outstanding in this game. I'll take it. <laughs> Ken Hobart and the Hamilton offense start at their 24-yard line. And Hobart going deep, looking for Rufus Crawford, but the ball was over his head. Boy, there was coverage back there. We're talking about three guys, Nelson Martin, Larry Crawford, and Keith Gooch. There was no way he was going to get that one in there. Riggs, you always worry about a young quarterback playing in his first Grey Cup game. I know Kenny Hobart's really been on a roll the last half of the season, but really in this first quarter, I think he's been kind of rattled. I think that pass rush got to him early, and... That was a poorly thrown ball and not in the right area. You're right, Leaf. He has to have a little patience, take off with the football, which has been his long suit all year long. Try to hit those little dump off pat patterns, maybe to Rocky, Di Pietro. Get something started. It's second down and 10 with the ball at the Hamilton 24. Flag is down. And Hobart's pass was intended for Rocky Di Pietro. going to be holding. Glenn Jackson. Very nearly picked it up. But we'll see what the penalty marker is about. I'm sure it's holding pad against the Tie Cats, and of course, will be refused. You know, it's tough. You work all week against a team that you think is going to blitz and play a lot of man to man. Now, all of a sudden, you find yourself in second and long. Hamilton, time. number 58. Decline. Third down. Well, that's Jason Riley, the left guard that got caught for holding, but. Second and 14, second and 10, second and 10. BC's just sitting back in his zone, and Hobart can't do a thing with it. And so right now, Bernie Ruoff is standing inside his 10-yard line to punt once again to Darnell Clash. And sooner or later, Clash is going to break one of these things. He's back at his 35. 
And he's out now over the 50 to the 51 yard line. And again, the BC Lions are going to have excellent field position. Rocky DiPietro was down there to make the stop for the Ticats. But now it's really imperative that Hamilton be able to contain the Lions here because it looks to me as though Roy DeWalt in that offense is really starting to find itself. They had a touchdown call back. They already lead the ball game 7-0 with 524 left to play in this opening quarter. Ned Armour is keen to get out here. He wants to break that formation, but referee Jake Ireland says, we're not set yet, so let's go get him again. The only touchdown of the ball game, an 84-yard pass and run, Roy DeWalt to Ned Armour. And again, here's that wide receiver screen to Jim Sandusky. And Sandusky is into the Hamilton 45-yard line before Howard Fields brought him back. That's exactly what I was talking about. Roy really seems to know now that he can set these guys up. Well, great block by Ron Robinson, the big receiver to the outside. You see him number 16. He got Donovan Rose, just enough of a piece of him. A little Sandusky can move with that football. Yeah, but ball control with the passing game. Quick pass, picks you up a first down. At the Hamilton 45-yard line. Now they do it to the other side, and Sandusky is there to make sure that he covers the ball because it obviously was a lateral pass as well, so they'll end up losing three yards on the play. Mark Streeter made sure he didn't get up and go. Donnie Matthews, the head coach for three years, two Grey Cup appearances. That's not bad, is it? Unbelievable record. He is so far ahead of every other active coach percentage-wise in the win-loss column. So on second and 13, DeWalt again with time throws. The pass is caught by Sandusky, but he's going to be a yard and a half short. Les Brown made sure that he did not get to the yard marker. And as a matter of fact, now they spot it at about the 38 and a half yard line, so he's going to be a full three yards. Pat, I just wanted to point out that the Hamilton Ticats are doing some deals in their line. They're only bringing those front four people, which we anticipated. They are crossing over, but they're not getting pressure against Roy DeWalt. That time they just came straight ahead. Normally they've been doing deals with a two defensive tackles, but no pressure on DeWalt so far. Well, Riggs, you and Leo Cahill talked about both offensive lines in your opening in the pregame, and you mentioned the experience of the BC Lions, and it really shows there. They did an excellent job in forming that pocket for Roy DeWalt. Well, I think Hamilton's going to have to bring some linebackers at least once in a while, maybe a halfback blitz, just to make Roy aware of it. Les Brown, who had that unfortunate happening of covering Ned Armour and then slipping off him, allow Armour to go the full distance for the touchdown was shaken up on that previous play. He's out of the ball game as Louis Pasaglia will try a 44 and a half yard field goal. And it is good. So add on three more for the British Columbia Lions. And they are out in front of the Hamilton Ticats, 10 nothing, with three minutes and 46 seconds left to play in the opening quarter. And gentlemen, I am going to suggest this to you. Hamilton better get on track soon. But I couldn't agree with you more, but that BC Lion defense is really attacking them. And that's, I think, what Leaf and I were trying to say a little earlier. They've got to take a little bit at a time and try to, instead of trying to get it all at once. Well, as Leaf has pointed out a number of times, when you set yourself up to be second and 10 or more against the defense like the BC Lions, you're just not going to convert those situations. Now they start from their 35-yard line with a first down. And they give to Johnny Shepard. Now Shepard picks up a good, healthy seven or eight yards before he's finally brought down by the quarterback, Darnell Clash. But that's exactly what you gentlemen were talking about. Oh, is that the Johnny Shepard we saw in 1983? Really no running room as he initially comes up the middle, breaks it to the outside, and he has great speed. Broke the tackle, Larry Crawford, and now you've got second and one. We've got some room to work with. Johnny Shepard, of course, two years ago was outstanding, but he was injured last year, injured much of this year. But he is the Hamilton running game, along with Hobart. And they're running with reckless abandon. Shepard goes right over the middle and picks up a couple of yards for the first down. 
Well, what this does is open up so many other avenues for Ken Hobart. Now, if you can get some kind of running game established, he can go to play action passes on first down, the little dump offs, and try and get something established. High Cats have a first down. The ball at their 46-yard line. Trailing 10-0 late in the first quarter. The pass is complete to Stapler. And Stapler is grabbed by Darnell Clash at the 53-yard line. But again, the Thai Cats do something on first down, where now they set themselves up for a second and three. Pat, that's a good illustration of the difference in the defensive philosophy, though. Three linebackers coming, four defensive linemen for the BC Lions, and man-to-man -man coverage, obviously. Clash having to back off and give the receiver a little road. Second down, three yards to go, Hamilton. Hobart's pass is caught by Stapler. Again, another first down for the Dan Gantz. The ball is at the BC 50-yard right. line. All right, now I they're starting to pick it a little bit. I think Darnell Clash watched the game film from their game against the Montreal Concords last week when Steve Stapler did catch three touchdowns, some long bombs. He's really respecting his speed, giving them lots of room, but I'm glad to see Ken Hobart recognizing that. So for the first time in this first quarter, the Ticats are in British Columbia territory with a first down at the Lions 51. Hobart quickly over the middle for Rufus Crawford, and Rufus was not able to hang on. Now, nevertheless, a good call by Hobart, trying to split the seam. There's the Prime Minister of Canada, Brian Mulrooney. Nice to have the PM here in Montreal. He couldn't have picked a nicer day. Didn't get much of a reaction from the crowd, though, when his picture went up on the stadium. So it's second down and 10. Hamilton at the BC 51-yard line. Hobart down the middle, way over the head of the intended receiver, Roger DiPietro. Larry Crawford went high, hoping to spear it himself, but it was well overthrown. James Parker put some pressure on Ken Hobart, and that obviously had something to do with the Aaron pass. That they do give a young quarterback an awful lot to think about. That time they played the Hamilton type of defense, just bringing the front four and laying everybody back off there now. But if nothing else, Hamilton has established some field position. That's here. right. They picked up two very important first downs there. Good punt by Bernie Ruoff has Clash at his six yard line. once again to make the tackle and now for the first time BC is going to be hemmed in their own end with just 44 seconds left to play in this opening quarter. There's no secret Bernie Ruoff when he's punting that football angling it towards the sidelines to let his tacklers get down and have a good angle. Ed Gadevac as you saw on the sideline number 39 second time he's made the play here in the first quarter. A man that many of us thought would be a factor in this ball game, John Pankratz, still hasn't caught a football. As DeWalt goes deep for Sandusky, he makes the catch, a sensational grab. And again, Les Brown was the quarterback on the play. He cannot believe it as Sandusky makes an unbelievable grab. Oh, watch the move. Initially he gets outside. Les Brown really kind of relaxing. I don't think he thinks the ball is coming to Sandusky, but Roy DeWalt puts it in the perfect spot. When you're throwing deep, throw it towards the sidelines where the corner can't make the play. Not a bad catch either. Well, that's the way to get out of your own zone in a hurry, isn't it? A 37-yard pickup. DeWalt throws from Ed Otto this time, but the pass was nowhere near him. Well, you talk about getting out of trouble in a hurry. It's the way to do it. 37 yards on the one play, and so with just four seconds left. Pat Sandusky made a catch like that. In fact, a little better than that during a regular season game that we telecast. It was almost unbelievable. We ran it back about seven or eight times, and we were still in awe. Well, Frank, that was in Winnipeg, and working against David Shaw, he made a one-hander. 
So let's see what Roy DeVal elects to do on the final play of the first quarter. He throws, it is complete to the back. We refer to John Pankratz. Pankratz has the first down in Hamilton territory at the 48-yard line before being dropped down by Mark Streeter as the first quarter comes to an end. And it's been a good one for the BC Lions. They lead it 10-0. This is great up 80. Well, you don't think those BC Lions were really, really forceful in that first quarter? 203 yards to 43 for Hamilton. Of course, they had some big plays, too. One for 84 yards, one for 37. Yeah, 121 yards on two pass receptions, two big plays. And now they're back in Hamilton territory at the Ticat 48-yard line with the first down. Go on. Fires. Ronnie Robinson slipped as he was getting set to make the catch. First time he's gone to Robinson, but now to Walt, obviously going to spread it around a little bit. As we take a look at the Honorable Brian Peckford, the Premier of Newfoundland, here enjoying the ball game, along with the Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, and a lot of other dignitaries here with a really big crowd at the Olympic Stadium. Assuming that the stadium now holds 54, 55,000, I've got to think that we've got in excess of 50. The wall fires over the middle, but again, it's incomplete. The intended receiver was John Henry White. So the Thai Cats bent a little bit, but they didn't break at least. And it's important now that they really hang tough defensively. Well, that's their theory on defense is bend, don't break. They play a lot of zone that time. They forced... Roy DeWalt to go underneath those linebackers, and even if he had hang, hung on to the football, he would not have picked up a first down. Well, Louie hasn't kicked for as good an average this year, but they've asked him to kick it away from the receivers quite often. I think he's trying to do that again. He did it well, and Rufus Crawford picks it up at his 10, but because the cover team was able to get down, uh, he only picks up three yards, so now it is really going to be tough on the young Hamilton quarterback. The rookie they acquired from the Edmonton Eskimos, believe it or not. Boy, let's say something about those Eskimos who had a great year. And let's say hello to an old pal of all of ours. J.D., Jack Parker, the head coach of the club, is in hospital. Well, we, under rest. we understand, Pat, that he's either getting out today or tomorrow, and we certainly wish him all the best. Absolutely. So the Ticats start from their 13-yard line. Hobart over the middle. It was very nearly picked off by Glenn Jackson. That would have been disastrous. They though. brought everybody on that play but one linebacker, and that linebacker almost had six points. Well, there's no question the BC defense is trying to rattle Ken Hobart, giving him a couple of different looks to, to see, and Glenn Jackson should have had that one. Now, let's tell you the story of Ken Hobart. He played for a couple of teams in the USFL, Denver and Jacksonville. He was a great player at the University of Idaho, but he was signed by the Edmonton Eskimos, who then sent him to Hamilton. Hobart throws down the middle, off Rocky D. Pietro's outstretched hands. And Hobart, who had an outstanding game last Sunday against the Montreal Concords, has not been effective here in the early moments of this football game. No, he hasn't. Once again, a second and long situation that he cannot convert. It is very difficult. BC dropping back in his zone, and he just couldn't do it. Bernie Ruoff stands a couple of yards deep in his end zone to punt on third and ten. and Frank Rigney watching the BC Lions put on an impressive performance. They lead it 10-0. And I want to remind you that we have a terrific show for you at halftime. It's called Discover the Stars. And you will, I know, enjoy it. You'll also see 
first half analysis with all of our expert commentators and the statistical story of that first half. DeWalt fakes that screen that he's been so effective with. Fires it down the middle. It's complete to the 15-yard line to John Pankratz. And, I mean, that is just perfect offense. They went so effectively to that blank screen so often, they faked it this time, just went right down the middle to Pankratz. Yeah, and what they do, too, with Pankratz is they fake him coming out on the block, and everything just opens up like the Red Sea. Here you're going to have a great look at it. Watch the Hamilton defenders race up. That frees Pankratz down the middle, and they just can't get over to make the play in time. First down. To the end zone. Boy, I'll tell you, did he take a chance looking for Pankratz again. But there was just great coverage by Mark Streeter, who went high in the air, tried to one-hand it. Unfortunately for <laughs> him and the Ticats, weren't able to do so. I thought Roy was trying to throw it away, but Streeter almost made a tremendous interception. So it'll bring up a second down for the Lions. The ball at the Hamilton 15. Ticats desperately need a big play defensively right now. Outside linebacker and make the hit. Well, it really was a big play defensively. Hamilton already trailing by 10 points. Really did not want to give up a touchdown at this point, and now they force Lou Pasagli into the ball game. Any chance all of a fake here, guys? There's 10 up right now. You know what? That's been Donnie Matthews' uh, philosophy in the past. He's a trick player, but. Pasagli picks it through from 20 yards out. It's a 13-0 score in favor of the British Columbia Lions. They have been dominant. We will remind you, this is Grey Cup 85 from Olympic Stadium in Montreal. On a picture postcard afternoon here in Montreal, I'm Pat Marsden, along with Lee Pedersen and Frank Rigney, and Bill Stevenson is down at field level. I'm down at field level, level as a matter of fact. And the thing I'd like to know, though, is what's happening out there defensively, Paul Bennett. Well, obviously, we're trying to stop a very powerful offensive football team, and they're moving the ball pretty well. It will right now. Uh, we're having a tough time, though, because they're, they're starting with such good field position, but they've scored once and pretty much a lucky one, a great catch by, I believe it was Armour. I thought Les Brown would, you know, was going to pull it away from him. Lucky break, but they've been, you know, Louis Bisagli is in, in field position to hit, and he's not going to miss too often. Are you going to have to get more pressure, though, if you're going to stop DeWalt? Oh, there's no question. We're going to have to you know, change up a few things, but, you know, we're not going to panic yet. We're hoping our offense can come around and put some points on the board. It's only 13 points. Okay, thanks, Paul. Paul Bennett, the great safety of the Hamilton Ticats, giving you his feelings on what's happened so far in this ball game. That catch by Rufus Crawford has given the Ticats a second and five at their 40-yard line. And again, this one was drilled in there and penning it for Steve Staple. But it was nowhere near it. So again, it's two downs and get rid of the football from a Hamilton point of view. And Barring something unforeseen, Darnell Clash should be able to give B.C. pretty good field position once again. You know, B.C. is playing so well defensively here in the first half. Glenn Jackson really forced that low throw, and that's really frustrated Ken Hobart here in the first half. He just has really had no working room. And look how well they played defensively against a great football team last week in the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. They just shut them down as well. This is Clash at his 30. And now he's at the 40, and he can be a lot further. And now he's at the 47-yard line before you guessed it, Ed Gattavecas was there to bring him down once again. But Darnell Clash is so elusive that if he ever gets to the outside, you can forget it. He'll be in the end zone. Of course, he set a record this year for the entire Canadian Football League in punt returns, 1,148 yards. Also had nine interceptions from that cornerback spot. An exciting little football player. And you know what he does? He excites the guys that are working on that return team with him. They just try that much harder to get a block when they know how hard he runs with that football. So again, the Lions start in great field position at their own 45. This is Freddie Sims on the block. The, the ball comes loose, and the Ticats have it. They needed a big play defensively. They get it right now at the 49. 
to strip him of the football. And Grover Covington was there to recover it. And what a year Grover's had. Oh, what a great game he had last week in their big win over Montreal. But the big break that maybe the Hamilton Ticats needed. Ball comes loose. There's 77 to pounce on it. Don't hurt that football, Grover. We're going to find out right now if we're going to have a football game. Because this is the opportunity Hamilton had to be looking for. They have first down at the BC 50. Hobart is down to the 42 yard line. This is what this kid has done all season long, taking it upon himself to make something happen. Finally brought down by Glenn Jackson, but Hobart will have an eight yard game. Now there's the big man, Grover Covington, who made that fumble recovery, but. That's what I like about Ken Hobart. He's not the flashiest quarterback in the league by any stretch of the imagination. He's just a guy that does anything he can to win a football game. Nine and a half minutes left to play in this second quarter. It's a 13-0 advantage for BC as Johnny Shepard was hit at the 40-yard line, and he's going to be about a half yard short, I would suggest. Mike Gray, the rookie of the year in the Canadian Football League, was there to bring him down, and what a year Gray had kid from the University of Oregon makes the big play again. Well, if I'm Al right. Reno, I take a chance right oh, here. They're going go to. His offensive team has said, Coach, we can do it, and he has waved off his punting team. And he's a full yard short of the first down, so this is going to be strength against strength right here. The BC Lions have a terrific front four, great line back and forth. Now, they may be pushed back no far class. enough by that offensive line of the Ticats. The give us to Shepard, he has the first down. He's to the 35-yard line with Kevin Ponar riding down at that point. Well, that's the intangible quality of a back like Johnny Shepard. There really was not a hole there, but he just made one little quick move with his feet. He got by Larry Crawford, and boy, has that a big first down to pick up. Ball is spotted just outside the BC 35. First down, Hamilton. Hobart slipped in, reloaded, throws for Ingram. What a catch! What a great grab! Ron Ingram from Oklahoma State University puts the Hamilton Tigers. We keep this going, and you'll see Tyrone Cruz, number 91, get a free shot. Stop it. Right here, here's Cruz coming in there all alone. If he comes in under control, he's going to sack the quarterback. He goes right by him. And what an adjustment to the football Ron Ingram makes. He had a big touchdown last week and simply outfights Keith, Keith Gooch for the football. The Ticats are back in it. is good. Hey, we've got ourselves a football game. With 8.03 left in the second quarter, it's now BC 13, Hamilton 7. This is Great Cup 85 from Olympic Stadium in Montreal. We've got eight minutes, three seconds left to play in the first half. And BC, who had everything their own way, now find themselves really in a football game. As you take a look at the man who really did a job to go up and get that football, Ron Ingram, has put Hamilton back in the game, trailing now just 13 to 7. That's Bernie Ruoff. He's set to kick it off to either Mel Bird, number 10, or Darnell Clash, number 1. This will be Bird at his 9. Bird with a good return is up to the 39-yard line. And Donovan Rose was there to bring him down as we go to Bill Stevenson. Ron Ingram, who was certainly the man of the hour. Ron, was that pass play exactly the way it was supposed to go? What was called? Yeah, it was. It was 89 wide while running takeoff. I knew we could do it. Uh, Gooch was squatting on me. And I went back to the whole huddle and told Ken, let's put him around the up. And he threw it out there. And I was fortunate enough to come up with the grab. Well, I tell you, he seemed to be covering you very tight. Well, not really. We just have to execute. We execute, I think, we can win. Well, this is Freddie Sims with the handout. Gets over the 40 to the 42. 
Rod Skillman was there to cut him down, but Hamilton seems to be getting uh, just a little tighter defensively. Pat, it was interesting to see Roy DeWall give Freddie, the, Freddie Sims a football right back because the first game he played for the BC Lions, he fumbled three times in that ball game. So it's second down, eight yards to go. DeWalt was under great pressure, and of course, that's exactly what Hamilton wants. Let's make him run and throw on the dead run. Grover Covington really put the pressure on him. And he did a great job, Leo Ezrin. Eight years in the Canadian Football League, spent a lot of time with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, came over to the Ticats. He had an outstanding year. I felt he should have been on the Eastern All-Star team, was overlooked, but great play there. So on third down, Louis Pasaglia is in the punt. And that old thing called momentum may well have switched over now to the Hamilton Ticats. This is a great boot by Pasaglia. This is Rufus Crawford. Took it on his 19, gets out to the 24-yard line. So that's where Hamilton's going to put it into play. But BC had everything going for them. Momentum, the scoreboard, everything. And two plays turned it around. When they gambled on third and one, and then the big catch. The other one, too, I think, Pat, that really helped the Hamilton Ticats is when they shut off BC down at their own 10-yard line and Blue Pasaglia had to kick the second field goal rather than putting it in the end zone. So Hamilton will start with the ball just inside their 25-yard line. never did get to him. There was a lot of pressure on the Hamilton quarterback. You know, fellas, if you look back at the statistics of 1985, you will not find the Hamilton Ticats very high offensively, but what they did extremely well was take advantage of those turnovers the defense provided them with. And that time, of course, a fumble recovery by Grover Covington led to that touchdown by Ron Ingram. Leap, just to make your point, they had 288 yards on average offense, eighth best in the CFL. BC averaged over 100 yards more than they did during the season. Hobart, he was going to be looking for Rufus Crawford or Ron Ingram. And now Ingram has something to say to Keith Gooch. And we'll keep an eye on those two because that's going to be interesting for me. If I was Gooch, I wouldn't be saying much to anything. He just gave up six. But Hamilton is going to have to get rid of the football once again with six minutes and seven seconds left to play in the second quarter. No, and the point that uh, both Leaf and Riggs were making is valid to a point, but in the second half of the season, under Hobart, Hamilton really did start to come out. This is Darnell Clash once again, and Clash is wrapped up by Leo Lesrins at about the 37-yard line. So now Hamilton starting to play well in all facets of their game, but not able to move the football offensively the last series of downs. Well, that's one thing that Al Bruno was concerned about, their big win over Montreal last week, was their inability to cover punch. Today they've done a much better job. Ball is actually spotted at the 39-yard line. DeWalt drops back, and now he's going deep. He's looking for Sandusky, but it's knocked away again by Mark Streeter. Threw right into double coverage, and John Pankraft was wide open over the middle. No question. I think Roy had his mind made up where he was throwing that one. Yeah, that's really one of, been one of his strong suits this year, is picking out the right guy in the right area to throw that football into. That time... As you mentioned, Frank, that was not the right guy to throw to. So it's second down. BC, the ball up there at 39 with 5.25 left to play in the second quarter. They lead 13-7. And DeWald is finally sacked by Leon Laskavich. The first sack of the ball game for that front four of the Ticats who have been so effective laterally. From the University of Alberta, Leon Laskavich, two big sacks last week in the Eastern Final, and finally they are able to get some pressure on Roy to walk, come up with a sack. That defensive line of the Ticats, which has been so impressive of late, 
Average is 258 pounds apiece. They stand six foot three. Lascavage, just about that size, only a little taller at 6'4", 255. Well, they're the major reason that those defensive backs were able to set that interception record this year. Bradford is back to his 27 and slips down. A little wet in some parts of the field, and you saw there, Bradford just lost his traction as he crossed the 30 and got to about the 31-yard line with four minutes and 55 seconds left to play in this first half, and it has become a very good football game. Despite the fact that Ken Hobart does not have very impressive statistics, the Ticats are right in it. The only one they really care about, Pat, we all know that. They're yeah. only six points down. First down, Hamilton at their 32. Hobart throws it over the middle and closes an incomplete forward pass. Looking for Rocky Di Pietro, but he was hit immediately by the middle linebacker, Tyrone Cruz, in 91. Well, he's one of the most active middle linebackers in the Canadian Football League. Plays the run superbly, and also the pass came up. And really, Rocky DiPietro had that football, but it was the good hit of Ty Cruz that knocked it loose. You know, Ty's big for a middle linebacker in this league. He's 238 pounds, and he does get around extremely well for that side. Been around the CFL for six full seasons, so Ty knows what has to be done in that middle linebacker position. Second down, 10 yards to go for Ken Hobart. Outstanding player in Eastern Canada this year. And this is what he does best. Hobart is inside the 20 with the 18. Rufus Crawford through the big block that allowed him to get all the way down there. What a run by Ken Hobart. the block on the right side by number 21, Rufus Crawford. He sits back there, can't find anybody. There's Crawford's block just in front of Hobart, and he uses it to great advantage all the way down to the 17-yard line. First down, Hamilton, they trail by six points with 3.50 left to play in the second quarter. And Hobart, with a good bit of scrambling and some effective work is finally brought down by Glenn Jackson, but he's inside the 15 at about the 13-yard line. I'll tell you, it's only because of his great running ability. He didn't lose about seven or eight yards with James Parker, the quick one, right in there. Watch number 40. Kind of really shows you why he finished third in the Canadian Football League in rushing this year. He seems to have eyes in the back of his head, but could not get around the 10-year veteran Glenn Jackson. Unbelievable to think that this man rushed for over 900 yards, and that has never been done in the CFL ever in the history of this league. By a quarterback. By a quarterback. The pass was underthrown. There's a penalty marker down on the field. Hobart was scrambling around so much, he just didn't have time to get set up. So with 2.52 left to play in the second quarter, we'll remind you this is Ray Cup 85 from Montreal. Hi. Kids from right across the country are really impressive young talent. You'll enjoy it, I know. We'll also have first half analysis for you, the copy stats, the scoring highlights, and we may well have a scoring highlight upcoming because the BC Lions were called for holding. That gives Hamilton a first down. The ball is at the BC seven yard line. The Ticats trail by six points, 13 to seven. They were down 13 nothing at one point. down to the two-yard line. That's an excellent call down the goal line with Ken Hobart spreads the receivers completely across the field and he knows the blitz is coming and if he just gets a little seam, he can get into the end zone. Ty Cruz made a great play. 
So they put that goal line unit in there right now with second down. The ball is at the BC two-yard line. And they give it to Shepard, but he just won't get in. Ty Bone Cruz, the middle linebacker, again was there to make the hit. Decision time for Al Bruno. Dude, yeah, I don't know. I, I got to go for it. I think you got to go oh, for yeah. it. BC winds up with the football at the one-yard line if you miss, yeah. and that's exactly what Al says. Let's yeah. go. He was successful on a third one-and-a-half gamble before. What he did last time was hand the ball off to Johnny Shepard. Shepard saw that it was closed off inside, and he just squirted to the outside and picked up the first down. Let's see what happens now. Third and goal to go from the one. Shepard over the top. Touchdown, Hamilton. of us agreed that if the Hamilton Ticats were going to win this football game, Ken Hobart was probably going to be the outstanding player because he was going to have to have a big football game. Well, what a great effort he made on that drive. 61 yards on one play, and then the first down after the holding call against BC, that quarterback draw set up the major score. Well, there's no doubt that uh, he has been a factor, despite the fact that I'm sure when we look at halftime at his passing stats, people will say, hey, what's going on? But he was only a 48% <laughs> passer anyway, I'll say so. Well, that's usually the defensive plan when you play against a guy like Hobart. Make him beat you with his passing, not with his running, but so far in the first half, he's really run the football well. Now, watch the lead block coming and Steve Jackson goes in motion the lead block by 51 Pat Brady and Johnny Shepard up and over the top no way they're going to stop him so Benny Jones who goes at 6'3 245 pounds will replace Mike Gray at the defensive tackle spot and Bernie Ruoff will try to give the Hamilton Ticats the lead for the first time in the ball game and he does with two minutes left to play in the second quarter let's go to Bill Stevenson the man of the hour is Ken Hobart. Ken, you seem to want to start running a little more on that drive. Is that correct? Did you change your strategy? Well, they're, they're playing pretty good pass defense, Bill. And I hurt my shoulder in the first quarter. Pulled something in there, so we're going to go with a little glass here, and we're going to use my legs a little more. You say you hurt your shoulder, but it's not your passing arm, well, is it's, it? it's in between, right? It's in the middle of my chest, kind of, but it affects my right, affects my right shoulder. So it's all right, but uh, we're going to try and start running the ball a little more, trying to use Johnny and myself. Keep the ball on the ground, get uh, ball control type offense going. Well, let's give him all the credit in the world. And how about that man, head coach Al Bruno? He's made all the right moves so far in this first half. His ball club is now in front, 14 to 13, as Bernie Ruoff will prepare to kick it deep to either Darnell Clash number one or Mel Bird number 10. You know, Pat, when you come into a game as an underdog in a game of this importance, I think you have to be a bit of a gambler, and so far it's paid off for Al Bruno. This is Glenn Leonard, and Leonard is able to get the ball up over the 35 to the 38-yard line. Now there's a minute 56 left to play in this second quarter. There's all kinds of time for the BC Lions. But this may well be a telltale time of this football game. How is Roy DeWalt going to react to finding himself for the first time trailing? I'll tell you, if I was Hamilton right now, Pat, I'd go after him. I'd come out with a blitz and try to put real pressure on him. Lions start at their 37-yard line. DeWalt to Sandusky, just a little bit off the mark. 
That pass was letter perfect the first three or four times. This time, just slightly off the mark. Well, listen, the defensive guys are no fools either. They've seen that play three times now in the first half. They're going to react to it a little quicker. But I know one thing. Roy DeWalt wants to win at halftime with the lead. He doesn't want to be trailing. Well, he's going to have to pick up a sizable game right now if that's his intent. Because with 153 left, he finds himself with a second and 10 from his own 37. If this is your first opportunity of seeing this man play football, Grover Covington led the Canadian Football League with 16 sacks this year. He has simply been outstanding in all phases of his defensive end position. Pat, once again, though, they bring only the front four people, and they're getting that pressure with just their defensive line. Watch now as number 77 picks up yet another sack. When he hasn't sacked him, he's still been pressuring him. And Leaf, I think that's the key to the, what they've done defensively. Not that many sacks, only two. Let's go back to live action. Well, this is where Pisagra couldn't get the punt away, and as a result, he ends up with a big first down for the BC Lions. Mitchell Price was the man who would have been there to block the punt, but he ran right by him, and Pisagra, the great veteran that he is, just scampered outside. Well, I'm sure that was not a design play. He just felt like Mitchell Price could have blocked the punt, but, you know, Louie was a quarterback at Simon Fraser. He's got that intangible quality to run with the football, and what a big play this could turn out to be. A minute 28 left to play in the second quarter. A one-point lead for Hamilton. The ball is at the BC 50-yard line, first down lines. They take the draw, and now they go deep. Looking for Ned Armour. Another touchdown. Another huge play by the Lions. They've only counted two of Ned Armour's touchdown, but he actually scored three. One was brought down on a penalty, but as this kid passed, he just flew by everybody. Well, we suggested that maybe that punt by Lucas Agnew it could turn out to be a big play. It was because it set up this long pass to Ned Armour. Les Brown once again could not provide the coverage, and Ned's got his second touchdown of the game. This is the man that replaced... Mervin Fernandez. Mervin who? could not start. Mervin who? <laughs> boy, oh boy, what an electrifying play that was. The point out by Pisaglia is good. And the Lions are back in front now, 20 to 14. There is Ned Armour from San Diego State. Seems everybody's from San Diego State today. His opposite number on the other side, Jim Sandusky, also from State, and Steve Stapler for Hamilton from San Diego State. But this is the man of the hour. He has two touchdown passes, compliments of Roy DeWalt. Pat, you suggested when the Hamilton Ticats scored with two minutes remaining that BC still had time. It took them 40 <laughs> seconds. Let's go to Steve Armitage. just tell you that that is Ned Armour that he's talking to. Unfortunately, what Ned is saying, we can't hear, but let me put it this way. He's probably saying, I'm happy the ball was there because I knew if it was long enough, I'd be able to get it into the end zone. Well, you know, Hamilton plays his own defense, so you can't get beat deep. Ned Armour's done it twice now. Rufus Crawford from his eight-yard line. Lucas gets it out over the 25 to the 26. Can Ken Hobart engineer some more magic? A minute 15 left to play in this first half. How have you enjoyed it so far? It's been a great first half of football. Exciting. I like the way Hamilton came back. And boy, great cups are like that. I remember in 1976, the punting game, Jerry Oregon ran for a big first down to give his team a lift. Now Lucas Aglia has done that for the BC Lions. And Riggs will remember a few great cups that were fairly exciting between <laughs> Winnipeg and Hamilton as well. Hobart gives it out to Johnny Shepard. And Shepard really good for us. Unfortunately, he did not shake Ty Cruz and he'll end up losing the yard or two. You know what Al Bruno's thinking right now? Holy cow, I hope we don't give him the ball back with more than a few seconds left to go. But he's got to be pleased with the way his club has oh, spot absolutely. back in the second quarter. 
And I think Donnie Matthews has to be pleased with the play of his middle linebacker, number 91, Ty Cruz, been extremely active. So it's second down, 12 yards to go with about 55 seconds left to play in the second quarter. for James Quick Parker because he thought he had Kenny Hobart two or three times in this second quarter. Now, now, he, he hurts him too. Boy, that's a punishing hit. Yeah, but I'll tell you who's hurt right now. Both James Parker and Glenn Jackson are down on the turf. Jackson is getting, Jackson's only missed one game in his career for the BC Lions. But James Parker, former great with the Edmonton Eskimos who has been every bit as good with the BC Lions since coming over a few years back is still down on the turf. Oh, what a tremendous athlete he is because not only did he make the hit on Kenny Hobart, he had the presence of mind to look around, locate that fumble on the ground, and he was actually the guy that came up with that recovery. Well, James Parker from Wake Forest has played in Canada for six years, and every year he's been outstanding, and he has just given the BC Lions possession at the Hamilton 22-yard line with 48 seconds left to play in this half. Pat, he's the only BC Lion that's ever played on a winning Grey Cup team. He, of course, was at the Eskimos in 1980, 81, and 82 when they won the national final. And that would be a tremendous blow to the BC Lions defensively if James cannot come back. You know, it's interesting when Donnie Matthews took over the job as head coach of the BC Lions, the first move he made was trade to trade for his defensive specialist, James Parker from Edmonton. 48 seconds remain. BC Lions first down at Hamilton's 22. Just moments ago, it was 14-13 Hamilton. It is now 2014 BC, and they're threatening to add more. But they're not going to get it that way because the pressure again came from inside. Mitchell Kreitz, number 65, was there to record the sack for the Hamilton Ticats. Now, once again, Roy DeWalt was going to go to the long bomb, trying to strike quickly. It just took a little bit too much time to develop. Looking for Jim Sandusky, but there comes big Mitchell Price. Mitchell yeah. Price had good technique on that seam spin off the block. He got, out, got away from two people, the offensive lineman. I believe it was Roper, and then he got away from John Henry White, who's a great blocker. Loss is nine yards. Ball is back at the Hamilton 31. Oh, they, they really trapped Rod Skillman. Skillman took an inside rush. Freddie Sims gets it down to the... Let's see, the 16-yard line, but that was the perfect play for the situation because with Skillman coming inside, Freddie Sims was able to just run right by where he had been. Well, Riggs kind of a takeoff of the old Statue of Liberty play. Roy DeWalt back, gets that arm up in the air, and then hands off to Freddie Sims. Nevertheless, they do come up short of the first down. And just as they did earlier in this ball game, Hamilton toughens up when BC was threatening to go in for another touchdown now. They'll have to settle for a Louis Pasaglia 24-yard field goal attempt. And it is good. So with just five seconds left to play in this first half, the BC Lions have gone out in front 23 to 14. But it's been a wonderful game. Oh, I can't believe it. Just a few moments ago, Hamilton took the lead 14-13. Now they find themselves trailing. Well, I want to say on behalf of the entire CTV crew, that includes Dale Isaac and Al McCann, who worked with Frank Rigney in the Western Conference this year, and on behalf of Lee Pedersen and Bill Stevenson, and I'm Pat Marsden saying we've really had an enjoyable 1985 campaign, and we look forward to seeing the second half of this ball game with our co-friars from the CBC, Don Whitman, Ron Lancaster, and Leo Cahill, because it's going to be very entertaining for the next 30 minutes. As the BC Lions and the Hamilton Ticats go at it for the national championship. And with second down and 11 yards to go, Hobart's not going to get fancy. They'll be quite content to run out the clock here, go to the dressing room down nine, and see if they can regroup. 
So that is the story at halftime. It is the British Columbia Lions 23, the Hamilton Ticats 14. We'll be back with our halftime show in just a moment from Grey Cup 85 in Montreal. Hello again, everybody. I'm Pat Marsden with my old pal Don Brickman. That was a pretty good half of football, wasn't it? thought it was a very entertaining half of football when the BC Lions jumped in front as they did. It looked as though it might be a first half blowout, but much credit to the Hamilton Tiger Cats. They played in that first half much as they did during the course of the season. They got off to such a bad start, one and six early in the year, then they came back in the second half. I wasn't really too surprised that the BC Lions struck late in that quarter. I was surprised that the BC Lions didn't come up with a second touchdown because the Hamilton Tiger Cats came up tough. Let me tell you this much. If the BC Lions score again, this game is over. But if the Hamilton Tiger Cats can put it in the end zone, you are going to have a terrific football game in that second half. The, the Tiger Cats are definite underdogs. I think if you go through their personnel, they do not rank with the BC Lions. But they have an intangible where they will not quit. And the front four of Hamilton has been outstanding for the last 10 ball games, and I think they've played well here today, too. And, Pat, the people we thought would emerge as the stars of this ball game are Roy DeWalt had an outstanding first half, passing for almost 300 yards, and he had one call back that would have added another 50 yards. But he got that big strike to Ned Armour for that 84-yard touchdown early in the ball game, and then the loop is likely a field goal, made it 10-0 at the end of the first quarter. In the second quarter, it went to 13-0. But then the Hamilton Tiger Cats came back with those two touchdowns, an exceptional grab by Ron Ingram, taking the ball away in the end zone, then the other touchdown by Shepard. But late, the BC Lions struck for 10 more points to assume the lead. Well, it's been a big, big play first half. 317 yards for BC, 163 to Hamilton, but it was the play, the big plays, armor for the BC Lions, and of course Hobart for Hamilton. Let's go to Brian Williams. Well, a tremendous first 30 minutes of football, and we looked for Roy DeWalt to be able to throw the ball deep, Hobart to run with it. Ronnie, were there any surprises in that first half to you? You know, not really, because I think both teams reverted back to their early season form. The BC Lions, the big play offense, and Hamilton having trouble moving the ball in the air passing. So, no, not really any surprises. Let's take a look at a few of those highlights. The first one, a very big play by BC. Boy, it sure was. Uh, you know, well, we just got finished talking about big plays. But Walt set four receivers to the right, that one-on-one -on -one coverage over here with Wes Brown. He makes a good defensive play, but the ball stays up on the shoulder pads, and Ned Armour grabs it, and then from then, it's a race. The BC Lions added a field goal, and it was 10-0 after the first quarter. Luke Sagley made it 13-0, and then all of a sudden the Ticats came back. All this took place because of the Sims fumble. Gave Hamilton field position, and you'll see he just out-jumped Keith Boots for the football. Good coverage, but he just went up and got it. Great job by Hobart of avoiding the rush, but watch the job he does now taking off the foot with the football. And great block by Rufus Crawford. Well, this is what he had to do for them to be successful. BC knew it. They had to try to contain him. The great block right there, and then just let him go. The BC Lions also called on a holding penalty here. Hobart called his own number from the seven-yard line, picked up five, and then Johnny Shepard went up and over for this score that put the Hamilton Ticats briefly ahead in this ball game. An excellent job because of the fact that they went and got it. That was an excellent call by Bruno. Uh, We've got to get back to our live action here and to bring the final 30 minutes, Don Whitman, Leo Cahill, and Ron Lancaster. Take it, guys. Thank you very much, Frank Rickney. And the second half is underway with the Hamilton Tiger Cats kicking off to the BC Lions, and the ball rolls into the end zone and then rolls into touch. Well, we're looking forward to an exciting second half here at Olympic Stadium, 23-14 the score. And Bernie Ruoff getting the second half underway, and he put the ball into the end zone, and the British Columbia Lions will scrimmage from their own 25. Well, it's time for well, us to get moving. I'm excited about the second half. I think that the Hamilton Tiger Cats are going to come back. Everybody up here seems to think that the BC Lions have it all put away, but uh, I've seen Hamilton come back all year long. What do you think, Ron? Oh, I think there's no doubt about it. they got to just hang in there. Don't change your plans. They're, they're playing well. So it's first and ten as Roy DeWalt gives to Fred Sims. Sims breaks one tackle, and he gets out to the 33-yard line. 
Fred Sims, who got a chance to play in place of the injured Key Van Jenkins and responded with an outstanding game against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in that Western Conference Championship game a week ago. Second and two for the Lions. Roy DeWalt indicating the count to his running backs. He takes the handoff. Fires incomplete. Intended for Rick Glasson. A little different twist by the BC Lions. That was a great play, really. They cleared the area out, cleared it out twice, and then he goes in on short yardage anyway. He just slides out into the open area. He catches the ball. It's a big game, but... <laughs> just didn't hang on. No reflection on Clausen, but in a situation like that, when you have to get the first down, I don't know that you throw to a guy that only catches the ball once or twice a year. Well, it is unusual, but that's usually the guy that's going to be open. That play by Lou Pisaglia late in the first half where he anticipated Mitchell Price was going to get through to block the punt and then ran for a first down could in the final analysis be a turning point in this football game. His third down punt to Rufus Crawford, and Crawford is upset at the 35-yard line. Well, let's see what the Hamilton Ticat offense can do in their first series of plays in this third quarter. Well, it's going to be interesting, Don, as the game progresses to see whether the uh, BC Lions come out with the same kind of defensive strategy. Early in that ball game, they put people up on the ends of the line of scrimmage, defensive backs, shut down any opportunity for the quarterback to roll out and play man for man and then went to zone on second down. We'll see whether they do that in first down here. In the first half, Hobart in throwing the ball. Badly missed the target on a number of occasions. He has a strike for the first throw on this second half. Rufus Crawford on the receiving end for a gain of seven. Kevin Konar came in to make the tackle. 23-14 is the score. Rufus Crawford, Mr. Versatility as far as the Ticats are concerned. But he has had, as Pat Leaf and Frank pointed out in the first half, problems with injuries. But he can play a variety of positions for the Ticats. Ken Hobart dumps it off. It was intended for Steve Jackson. And it goes incomplete. So the Ticats send out their punting unit. Actually, it was the second time now in as many tries for both teams that they dropped critical first down plays. He could have caught that ball. He would have had a first down on it. And Hobart, as you see him roll to his right right here, makes a good decision, but threw the ball a little bit behind the receiver. He could have caught the ball for the first down. Or down. Darnell Clash, the long punt return man back in anticipation of this third down punt by Bernie Ruoff. He kicked the ball very well during the first 30 minutes. This an end-over-end kick, perhaps his poorest of the football game. Taken by Clash, he wobbled it momentarily. He's trying to get outside, but he is prevented from doing so by Rocky D. Pietro. But Bernie Ruoff's kick that time, traveling just 32 yards. This is Break Up 85 from Olympic Stadium in Montreal. It's approaching 4 o'clock Eastern Time in Montreal. The sun beginning to sink in the west as the crowd at Olympic Stadium looks on with 12.30 remaining in the third quarter. And wherever you're looking in this afternoon, we hope you're enjoying Grey Cup 85 for Montreal. I'm Don Whitman along with Ron Lancaster and Leo Cahill, our CBC broadcast crew, provide you with the action in this second half. Freddie Sims again the ball carrier. And Sims has a gain of eight yards. I was expecting the BC Lions to run the ball a lot today anyway. This is their sprint draw series. John Henry Wright blocks on Covington. Gets a good block from the right guard. Willis Leonard comes through and Sims picks up the yard. So I was kind of not surprised to see him run the football. They've got to move the ball a little bit. Not the big plays. They're going to be able to shut those down on. Sims is now rushing for 43 yards. He gets the ball again for a first down to the 50-yard line. And he's stopped by the safety call. Well, you know, all year long we haven't seen any teams that really had consistency with their running game. Maybe other than the Winnipeg Blue Bombers with uh, Reeves. But this, after this afternoon with that front four coming through, we're watching Sandusky coming downfield now. It's pretty rough downfield on that one-on-one. -on -one. 
with that big front four coming through there and putting a lot of pressure on the passer, it does, as Ronnie suggested, open up those slots in there for the uh, run play, on the, especially on that spread draw where the quarterback looks like he may be going out to pass and hands off. Because there's going to be a time in the second half when that big front four is going to get tired and those seams are going to open up. And at that time, a running back like they've got in there with the BC Lions, you can bust through there. Either one of them, for that matter. John Pankratz was the intended receiver. It is second and 10 from the 50 yard line. Ed Armour, who has scored two touchdowns, goes wide to the left. Roy the wall, throwing it down the middle. It's incomplete. Paul Bennett, the safety, had a glorious interception opportunity. Well, you see, Don, what, what we said early in the game and all week, we talked about the linebackers of the Ticats getting deep. When they get deep, the quarterback, that is a tough throw to put it over the top and down in. And watch, it's just too far. You see the linebackers underneath it. It goes over top of the receiver's head, and Paul Bennett just drops an interception. Well, we've seen him all year long stand in that center field position and make those interceptions, and that's one that he really wanted. Tolo Pisaglia stands at his own 35 for this third down punt. Rufus Crawford takes it at his own 21. Nowhere to go. British Columbia has done a good job in coverage on those special teams, and those special teams were a key ingredient in their victory over the Winnipeg Blue Bombers last week. Well, I know that's been one of their key ingredients all year, but as today, I believe both teams have done a good job. Ed Gattamekis has done a great job for Hamilton. Neither team's been able to get what they want out of the special teams, and that's a good credit to the defense. Paul Bennett, Toronto, Winnipeg, back to Toronto, traded briefly to Edmonton. He never suited up with them, played with the Hamilton Tiger Cats this year, and wound up winning the Shenley Award as the country's outstanding Canadian player. He was nominated in two categories. He lost the other to Winnipeg's Ty Jones. Rick Blossom gets through to sack quarterback Ken Hobart. This, to me, has been the difference in the football game today. The BC Lions front four have been able to get more pressure on DeWalt or on to uh, Hobart. They haven't been able to get to DeWalt too much. Once, once again, they try to keep him inside. You see Parker chase him inside, and there's Classen to make the tackle. They've been getting by those offensive linemen in Hamilton. One thing about the BC Lions front four is that they have the quickness on the inside that Hobart can't step up inside them like he has done against a lot of teams. Second down play. Hobart over the middle. The pass is complete, but Steve Stapler is stopped about four yards short of a first down by Larry Proffer. What they want to do, they try to throw a swing pass out to the right on a screen, and Stapler is the alternate receiver. He finds the hole. Hobart finds him. It's just too bad he didn't get the first down. Larry Proffer made the hit. So oh, once again, Darnell Flash, number one, old man now for his third down punt. And the British Columbia Lions, on most occasions, except on that one play where they were back at their own six-yard line, have enjoyed pretty good field position each time they have started an offensive series. British Columbia managed to retain possession as the ball bounced away from Darnell Clash. You know, that, that's just about the place they fumbled before. This is Grey Cup 85 from Olympic Stadium in Montreal. I've got James Quick Parker with me. James, you took a hit late in the first half. What happened? Uh, the ball, when the ball was out, uh, a lot of guys was jumping around. I just happened to be on the bottom of it. I got... The worst of it basically is just, uh, I just got hit from being on the bottom of the pot. The Lions seemed to lose some momentum uh, late in that uh, first half, but you got it back. Yeah, you know, they're, they're a good team. They're playing hard, and we uh, trying to get control of stuff because the momentum do shift. We're just trying to keep the most of it. Good luck. Thank you. Roy wall taking to the outside, not going deep. Incomplete. Intended for Ned Armour, who is being covered by Donovan Rose. Talmadge Ned Armour is given name. Talmadge, he prefers to be called Ned. He replaced Mervyn Fernandez. What pressure he came into that Western final under. He responded with a brilliant performance, and he has two touchdowns in the Grey Cup game. Well, that's about all you can say. The guy does have the great speed, and you just crowd him, and he's gone, so he's got to be a threat in about 20 yards on stop the hooks. 
second down 10. The ball is up the line, 43. They lead 23-14. There's the handoff to Glenn Sims. And Sims is going to be stopped short of the first down at the 49-yard line by Leon Lascavage. You know, Don, you talk about Herb Fernandez not being in the ball game. Congratulations to Herb Fernandez and the rest of those Shetley Award winners the other night, Paul Bennett, Tyrone Jones, Nick Mastai, and Mike Gray. And I was really impressed at that show the other night by how each of those guys spoke and how well they conducted each other, I mean, conducted themselves, I should say, in front of that huge audience. There you'll see the reverse right there, well recovered by the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Third down by Lou Basaglia, he hangs it high. Bobber goes back to his own 10 yard line, he slips there. There's nowhere for Crawford to go. That was a 51-yard kick by Louis Saglia. Jamie Bleas was downfield covering for Don Matthews, British Columbia Lions. You can't say enough about the job Matthews has done as head coach of the Lions, yet he has not been rewarded with Coach of the Year honors. However, leading the Lions to a 13-3 record in regular season play this year, and if he does manage to hang on to this lead, he may be so honored come January up in Edmonton. Hold on. Difficulty picking out a receiver, and Rick Lawson is there for the tackle. Sacking Ken Hobart, and Rick Lawson appears to be intent upon earning that outstanding performer award from this 1985 Grey Cup game as he did in 83. Well, that, go ahead, that, you want to throw an out pattern to the right side, and when the man was covered, those outside ends forced him inside, and there's Classen waiting on him. But Classen has had an outstanding year talking to Don Matthews during the week. He felt he's played well all year. And I think, Ron, the big difference again, the inside of that defensive line of the BC Lions have the quickness that they're taking any kind of stepping up away from uh, Hobart, he just doesn't have the opportunities he's had a lot during the season of stepping up inside there and running. They just recover off their blocks and make the tackle. Johnny Shepard stopped by Kevin Konar. It was second and 16 for the Ticats. There you saw James Parker loop real wide to the outside. That inside seam was open, but they needed too many yards. You're not going to run for that many yards. BC was content. They'll let you have that. Make the tackle get good field position. You, are, you hit it right on the head. The Lions have had great field position most of the day. And they're going to get great field position again as Bernie Ruoff is kicking from his own goal line. He's had a lot of work this afternoon. He has already punted the ball ten times. Now, speaking of field position, as long as they can keep the young quarterback in a dangerous position on the field, he's very subject to make mistakes, and Donnie Matthews knows that. Darnell Bosch looks for a couple of blocks. There are penalty flags as he has is stopped by Randy Ravatsky. It appears as though the call will go against British Columbia. A 48-yard punt that time by Bernie Ruoff, but the return of Darnell Clash will be wiped out by a holding violation. That 10 yards that they're going to lose right here on, on the, it's the penalty, you, you don't want to lose those. BC number 31. First down. You don't want to lose that because they had the ball at midfield and you had a short distance. Every time you exchange ball, you want to gain field position. off to Freddie Sims, and Sims fights his way out to the 45. Leon Lascavage was there to make the tackle. Freddie Sims is a little different runner than the man he replaced, Keevan Jenkins. Sims seems to have more strength. He's able to drive straight ahead, where Keevan Jenkins was more of a fancy runner. He was quick. Keevan Jenkins is real quick. You give him a hole, he's gone. Sims can run inside or outside. He comes from the University of Oklahoma in his third game. He's a power runner, 210 pounds. Over the middle, the pass is complete to John Pancras. And Pancras fights down to the 34. He caught that pass between the two linebackers, Ben Zambiazzi and Leo Azarenz, and he took it down to the 34. A gain of 32 yards for John Pancras. Yeah, but I think that the Hamilton Tiger Cats have to get close in this third quarter. The big reason that they're going to have to get close is we see DeWald go back 
get it down there to Pat Kratz, and this is the guy that I picked before the game as the dark horse because he can get in there and get into those seams and catch the football. He can run with it when he catches it. But I think that the Hamel Tiger Cats got to stay uh, close in this third quarter because in the fourth quarter, if they don't, that front four are bound to be tired. And when they get tired, they're going to get reckless with their rush. And at that time is the time that those running backs are going to get up inside and sustain the football, keep it away from Hamilton. They're not going to be able to get the football. A gain of three at second and seven on that carry by Fred Sims. The wall throwing deep. Ron Robinson was covered by Howard Fields. Great coverage. He was there. He just got that right arm out and knocked it away. 518 is the time remaining in this third quarter. It's still 23-14. The BC Lions leading Hamilton. There you see, just at the end, it looked like Robinson might have had a shot at that right arm come out underneath. That's what you gotta do. Get on him close and stay on him. Took a pretty good hit after it. Grover Covington, you know he's always close. Another field goal attempt by Lucas Aglia from 37 yards out. And again, it's good. And the BC Lions stretch their advantage over the Thai Cats to 12 points. This is Break Up 85 from Olympic Stadium in Montreal. Lupus Aglia has certainly stamped himself as a candidate. He's perfect in the field goal department, four for four. That's that's a great beat in itself, four for four, but that run of his on third down, a lot of, as you said earlier, could have been the turning point of the game. You never know. We'll see. Johnny Shepard finds a hole, and he'll have close to a 10-yard game. Glenn Jackson finally halted the progress of the Hamilton running back, but not before he had picked up a first down. Don, every time they've called on Johnny Shepard this afternoon, he's produced. Maybe they're going to have to give him the ball a little bit more. Watch him here as he takes it through there. He can bust through there as quickly as anybody can. And although he's not a very big guy, he's got great leg strength and he can break tackles. Product of Livingston University. What a find he was for the Ticats. Hobart throwing deep down the sidelines. Incomplete. He was looking for Ron Ingram who is being covered by Darnell Bosch. Well, you have to do that every now and then. Just get back there and let it go. He has the speed on the outside in Ingram. He's got clash one-on-one -on -one down the sidelines. Darnell just played, made a good defensive play. It will be second and ten for the Ticats. Darnell Clash got up limping a bit as he headed back to that... BC defensive unit, and there is an injured BC player out there. Rick Clausen is down on one knee. Product of Simon Fraser University. And how the British Columbia Lions have reaped the rewards of the football program at that school. Boy, I'll tell you, there's a bunch of them around, and it's been one of the good schools to produce football players for the CFL. They must have a great program. They've got to. Kenny Jones goes into the ball game, replacing Rick Blossom. Jones and Nick Hepler alternated at defensive end in last week's Western Championship win over Winnipeg. Hobart taking off, running for the first down and more. The Lions went to that zone defense again, and when they do that, it's going to open it up for Hobart. They're going to shut down the pass, but it's going to allow him to just take off and run with it. I don't think very many people know just how fast he was because Glenn Jackson had the angle on him that time and he still beat him to the sidelines. 15 yards on that carry for 91 in the ball game. And he has clearly demonstrated this afternoon why he ran for almost 1,000 yards during regular season play with the Ticats. He is a skilled runner. They were after him with the best of passes intercepted. Kevin Conar grabs it and is all down at his own 44. The blitz was on, and Hobart would like to have that one back. That was a screen middle that time. He had all the blockers and everything set up right there. The unfortunate thing was that he threw the ball right into the red shirt hand. He came with a safety blitz for one of the first times today. At least I haven't seen it. He had to get rid of the football, and as you say, he'd love to have that back because he'll advise at this stage of the game, or any stage, I guess. 
Well, we talked about Simon Fraser's contribution to professional football. University of British Columbia hasn't done badly either. That's the school that Kevin Konar attended. Freddie Sims finds a hole. Sims is a tough man to bring down. He'll fight off wild tackles and will shake off those tacklers, and that time he picked up about 14. Well, if they will just keep alternating that running and passing game now, like they've been doing in this third quarter round, they're going to be very, very tough to beat. Well, it breaks inside again. You just give the ball deep to a good back, you'll find the hole. Boy, they chopped on that backside linebacker, and that gives him the whole backside, and then it's just you run till they stop it. Now you see what happens. Those defensive ends are coming on that hard outside rush, and it opens up those inside seams. There it comes again. And Sims has another big game right now. Let's go to Steve Armitage. Kevin Tonar is with me. Kevin, did you have the safety blitz on that time? No, we just had a base defense, and he overthrew the screen. I just happened to be in the right spot. You seem to be getting lots of pressure on him. Yeah, our, our front four is doing an excellent job. We just got to keep it up. Hobart is a great runner. Not. All right, Steve. Well, Greg Gary has come out of the ball game defensively. Gadebeckis has gone in. Ron Henry White gets the call this time. Brad Sims, who has done the bulk of the running for the British Columbia Lions, is closing in on 100 yards, and he is now going out of the ball game as we look at quarterback Ken Hobart taking a breather on that Hamilton bench. But he has to try and get that Hamilton offense on track if the Ticats are going to get back in the ball game. Right now, the British Columbia Lions leading by 12, very much in control. a wall on the short yardage play will be close. He was stopped by Leon Miscavige. Don Matthews had sent in the short yardage offense. Matthews waiting for a signal as to just how far they are away from that first down. And he calls John Pankratz and Ron Robinson back to the bench while they bring out the chain to measure. I think he's going to be a little bit short on this. The wall couldn't fall forward. They grabbed him and pulled him back. What do you see about a half a yard? About a half a yard. I think they're going to go for it. Now Bruno made a couple of calls on third down situations. That produced for the Ticats. Juan Matthews leaves his offensive unit out there. They're going after it on third down. It'll be a quarterback sneak. Roy to Walt. Going straight ahead. Fumble the football. And the Hamilton Ticats say they've recovered. Howard Fields comes up with the football, but had the whistle gone. I believe it has. Well, the referee had clearly marked. But boy, it had to be a quick whistle because that was a heck of a hit. Al Bruno's taking a chance here. He's about 10 yards out on the field screaming at the officials. they got to get him off there. Can't afford a penalty at this stage. Placement of the ball, extremely important here, but it is a first down for the DC Lions. Well, we're going to get a good look at it. Look, Sammy Azzi really let him have it on that quarterback sneak, and the ball come loose, and Howard Fields is there, but... The referees marked his forward progress and awarded the first down. Well, I'll tell you one thing, Ron. That ball came loose before he hit the ground. I think it should have been a fumble. I think Al Bruno's got a point. Well, he was right in front of that play from his position on the bench. John Henry White, the ball carrier, and uh, he got to the line of scrimmage. As a matter of fact, he may not even have reached the line of scrimmage. You know what they're doing, Don Ron? Their defensive ends from Hamilton have been doing a lot of gaming on their pass rush, coming inside and coming outside and taking either advantage on their pass rush, giving up either the inside or the outside. Now they're handing off to John Henry White and the Sims, and they're just running right at their offensive tackle and either veering to the outside or taking the inside in order to get those big runs. A loss of one in second and 11. The walk to the sidelines, and Ed Armour has it. But he is short of the first down. I think any time you're going to gamble on second down long yardage, the reason they throw the ball to the outside, your receiver has to go deep enough to get that first down. He's going to come up heck, about three, three and a half, four yards short. That's a, uh, 
crazy. I don't know what Ned was thinking of when he caught that football, too. There wasn't anybody within five yards of him, and he kind of turned and stepped out of bounds. Well, that was the final play of the third quarter, and this is Grey Cup 85 from Olympic Stadium in Montreal. Well, to start the fourth quarter, Lou Pasaglia will be attempting his fifth field goal of the ball game. In case you're wondering, the most field goals in a Grey Cup game, six by Don Sweet in the 1977 game. Twenty-seven yard effort. It is good. And Pisaglia is five for five. And Don Matthews extends the hand to congratulate Pisaglia prior to the ball game. Some discussion as to which side had the advantage in the kicking game. So far today, Lou Pisaglia is way ahead of Bernie Ruan. Well, I know talking to Frank Rigney yesterday and the day before, he felt that if there had to be an edge, and he said only if, that Pasaglia was a quarterback, he could run, he could throw, and his running ability and, you know, heads-up play, that big turning point in the second quarter. Yeah, but in all fairness to Bernie Ruoff, his team hasn't got him in a position where he can kick some field goals this afternoon. We know he's been a great contributing force to that Hamilton Tiger Cats. Well, you just got two of the best out there this afternoon, and it's a real pleasure to see two guys like that on the same field. Lou Pisaglia will be kicking off following that 27-yard field goal. Edom Raw was a cry of Hamilton defensive units back in the 50s and early 60s when they were a top, top team. Ball bounces to Johnny Shepard. And Shepard is stopped at the 32-yard line. A 61-yard kickoff by Lou Pisaglia. A big edge statistically for the British Columbia Lions as Roy DeWalt has passed for 328 yards. The Hamilton Ticats have not had any success throwing the ball. They've relied on the running game, particularly from quarterback Ken Hobart. And if they're going to get back in this ball game, Hobart has to start moving the team through the air. He gets to John Shepard, and Shepard has a gain of five. Now let's go down to that Hamilton bench and Bill Stevenson. Grover Covington, one of the finest linemen in the business. What do you expect from BC now that they've got a fairly large lead for the rest of this game offensively? Well, basically, they're just going to mix up. I think they're uh, just going to come out and uh, try to run. And we just got to go out there and try to strip the ball and cause some turnovers so we can, uh, you know, get back into the game. Because it's not over yet. we got 14 minutes yet to play. And we're just two touchdowns back. And, you know, this is a great cup. Anything can happen. So uh, we're just going to go out there and continue to play hard and just, uh, just try to get some turnovers. And hold on. On the quarterback drop, he slides into the midfield strike. You know, if Ken Hobart can just read it, and I know Ronnie's having trouble because he's just a rookie, but if he can read when they're going to be in zone and when they're going to be a man for man, and I think it's very simple, they bring those halfbacks up on the line of scrimmage on first down when they're a man for man. And on zone, he's got a lot better chance to step up inside there and run like he did on that one right there because those linebackers and everybody are out of there. Got over the 100 yard mark in rushing this afternoon. Now he slips as he tries to throw the ball. He was fortunate to recover as the ball slipped away from him. Let's go now to the BC bench and bring in Steve Armitage. John, I got Louis Pasaglia with me. Louis, the kicking toe is working well this afternoon. I, I felt good all day today and I was excited all week. We've got three or four guys playing their hearts out today and it's it's fun playing out here. The conditions are excellent. Louis, for your own information, you're one shy of the record. Uh, I don't mind a record as long as we win this game. There's still a lot of time left. And the way they scored those points in the second quarter, they can still come back. Not talking about time. 12.40. And the clock is running, remaining in this fourth quarter. British Columbia Lions leading 29-14. Second down play. Deep down the sidelines for Ingram. He made the catch! I'll tell you, you'll never, ever, ever see a better catch than that, Ron. I don't know how he caught it. I don't know how he even saw it. Well, 
Well, the big thing is Hobart knows he's got to put it up, and he gambles, and he is covered. Larry Crawford's got great position, and he just bends his body back and concentrates, and it is a great catch. Look at that. That's body control. How you're falling down and find it in the air and hold on to it. It's great. Let's see what, just what he does. You see, it's that zone defense. There he is. There's Crawford in great position, but watch the catch. Oh. He had three problems, finding the ball, making the catch, and then managing to keep his feet inbounds. Well, that's how football games are turned around by big plays like that. And you wonder how things like that can happen because it was a superhuman catch. But there they are right now, down about on the 12, 13-yard line. 48 yards on the pass completion. Hobart over the middle, he hit the crossbar. Just as well he did, because Glenn Jackson's going to intercept that pass. What he needed to do, lay it up. The guy was open. You got 25 yards back there. Throw it all the way back. Hobart has hit on only 7 of 23 attempts for 125 yards. You see what Ron is talking about right there, Ron, and I know that you've directed a lot of passes like this in your career. When you've got the guy with the deep end zones that they have in Canadian football, you don't want to rifle it in there. Just lay it up in the air and let him run under it. Second and 10. The ball is at the 13 with 11.47 remaining in the game. Hobart will try and run this. He won't get a chance as Mike Gray, with help from Nick Hepper, makes the tackle. Well, you can't say too much about the way the BC Lions are playing defense. That time the front four did it. We're going to get a good look at it here. Hobart sprints to his left. You see the ends are real wide. In fact, you can't even see Hebler. Now he tries to run outside. Gray's there, and Hepler's just sitting there waiting on him when he comes back. A lot of ends will, cons you know, they'll jump back inside and get beat. Hepler waited. I'm sure everybody could see how they how they all kept their lanes in there, kept themselves in a position that if he did step up inside there, they could recover inside or outside to make that play. And that's what you call disciplined defense at that point. Bernie Ruoff will be attempting a 26-yard field goal. Penalty flags on the play. Prior to the ball being snapped, there was movement at the line of scrimmage. I believe it was against the BC Lions. Offside is the call as Don Matthews looks on intently. It's a football now! However, I don't think it will alter the situation as far as the Ticats are concerned. Because they will still be... 11 yards short of moving the yardsticks. Outside, BC number 77. Third down. Mike Gray was the man who jumped prior to the ball being snapped. So Bernie Ruoff will be attempting this field goal from five yards closer to the uprights, kicking it from the 21. Tom Porras comes out to hold. And Ruach's kick is good. And that counts for the 11-11 remaining in the ballgame. 29-17 is the score. And this is Break Up 85 from Olympic Stadium in Montreal. From our camera atop Olympic Stadium, the lights of the city come alive on this Break Up night. The crowd here at Olympic Stadium has been treated to a very entertaining football game. It looked early as though the British Columbia Lions might just blow away the Hamilton Tiger Cats. The Tiger Cats have fought back. They have fallen behind again, trailing by 12 points. Roy DeWalt gives to Fred Sims. And Ben Zambiazzi, who has played a very strong game from his middle linebacking position, comes in to make the tackle. Right now, let's go down to Steve Armitage at the BC bench. They're working on the hand of Nick Hebler. He came off the field and the hand was cut. They've stitched it up and they're putting some tape on it. He hopes to get back into the ball game, but it was bleeding quite badly. Well, of course, Nick Hebler missed the 1983 Grey Cup game against the Toronto Argonauts as the result of an injury. Nick has had some problems over the last couple of years with the injury bug. Long pass intended for Jim Sandusky, who was being covered by Howard Fields, and then Donovan Rose came over as well. I, if I was Donnie Matthews and I was in that position on the field, 
And I know with just 11 minutes left in the ball game, that they would kind of be anticipating that I'd be running on first down and possibly throwing the ball so I wouldn't be giving up that lead on second down. I'd think a little bit about some play action on first down, Ron, rather than running right at them. Luke Basaglia stands at his own 20-yard line for this third down kick. There was pressure as they were trying to come from the outside with Les Brown. Absolutely nowhere to go for Rufus Crawford. He is stopped at the 40-yard line, and BC has done an exceptional job of covering on third down kicks, and Jamie Buis was there that time to make the stop on Rufus Crawford. This is Grey Cup 85 from Olympic Stadium in Montreal. As the Ticats prepare to scrimmage from their own 40-yard line, that injury Steve Armitage talked about to Nick Hebler is keeping the defensive end out of the ball game, and he is being replaced by Benny Jones. Ten minutes is the time remaining in the ball game. 29-17. The Hamilton Ticats under the direction of rookie quarterback Ken Hobart Trail. Johnny Shepard trying to get outside, fumbles the football. He was fortunate to get it back. Larry Crawford from his halfback position came up to stick Johnny Shepard, and he lost control of the ball. Well, the BC Lions always like to have that the defensive back on the close side of the field, this time to the left, up on the line, and he's there for this reason alone. When that guy cuts the back to the outside, he should be there waiting on him, and he was there. It's also a great position in case Obar wants to run with the football to the outside, too. See, that's how Shepard made some yards in the first half, but not this time. Back to the live action. The second down play. Obar throwing deep. He's looking for Stanford. Incomplete. He was being covered by Darnell Clash, and I think Steve Stanford may have just mistimed his jump. It looked like he was behind him. It looked like the ball was there, and then something happened, so it had to be something in his coordination and jumping ability that he just didn't hang on. I don't think the defender touched the clash, didn't touch the ball at all. Boy, it went right through his arms. You know, we've seen three touchdown passes today that were much more difficult catches than that. So Bernie Ruoff will be kicking it from his own 20-yard line. Darnell Clash takes it at his 31, looking for some blocking to four, trying to go outside now. John Priestner is after him, and with some help from Greg Gary, they finally corral the very elusive Darnell Clash. Well, for the next two years, the Grey Cup game will be played under the dome out in Vancouver, and this might very well be the last Grey Cup game ever to be played out of doors because they are putting a roof on Olympic Stadium and by the time 1988 or 89 roll around, Toronto may finally have that dome stadium. Well, we're sure hoping so in Toronto, Don. By the looks of this team out here, Vancouver team or BC team, they may be playing at home in that Grey Cup a couple times. The long pass is complete, deflected into the hands of Jim Sandusky, touchdown! state of Washington. As those folks look in this afternoon, they'll be doing some cheering. Well, I, know, well, I thought it was Paul Bennett, but we're going to get a look at it. But when things are going right, they go right. But watch, right down the middle. Boy, that's a great it job of your hands. Yeah. That is concentration because it bounced right in his hands. A 66-yard touchdown from Roy DeWalt to Jim Sandusky. 35-17. The BC Lions are now in front. Tremendous concentration on the part of Jim Sandusky to grab that deflected throw. Point after by Pasaglia. Penalty flags on the conversion attempt. And I think it will go against Hamilton. Hamilton number 15. The time, Robert is good. 
So the convert holds, and the British Columbia Lions are totally in control of this football game with 8.26 remaining. This is Grey Cup 85 from Olympic Stadium in Montreal. Jim Sandusky, super job of concentration. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank the Lord for everything he's given me. And, uh, you know, um, you know, this is the greatest game right here, you know, the Grey Cup, and we've just been playing great. You think they'll be washing in the uh, state of Washington? Oh, yeah, back in Othello, I'd like to say hi to my mom and dad and, and uh, my sister Nancy and in Colville, uh, the rest of my brothers and sisters. Okay, Jim, thank you. Don? Well, that saves the price of a phone call. Jim Sandusky with that 66-yard touchdown. And on this kickoff return, Rufus Crawford fights his way out to the 39-yard line, and Darnell Clash was there to bring him down. Well, the roof at Olympic Stadium, and on the left of the screen, you see the piece of architecture that is rising and will eventually provide the cover for the hole in the big O. First down play, Johnny Shepard trying to get outside, and he'll get a first down, being forced out of bounds at the 54 yard line by Darnell Clark. Well, you know, you're going to see some good games now on the running game because the only way to handle the Tiger Cats can win is put the ball in the end zone, and you're going to have to go through the air because you can't use up this valuable time. So the Lions are going to give you these now. I think you're going to see the Lions go to a lot more zone defense right now. They'll be playing deep, and they're going to make Hamilton earn it the hard way, Ron. As you say, it's going to take a little longer to get there. 17 yards that time for Johnny Shepard. First down play from midfield. And Hobart got away from the first man, throws down the sidelines for Steve Stigler. They really stepped out of bounds, and he's got a first down at the 41. Hobart did a good job of escaping Larry Crawford, the halfback who was chasing him in that Hamilton backfield. Boy, he sure did. You know, Crawford's a defensive back. He's got good quickness, but Hobart showed a lot of quickness himself. And then Stapler found a hole, and he found him on the run. First and 10, the ball is at the 41. 7.36 is the time remaining. The BC Lions in front, 36 to 17. Hobart almost intercepted. He was looking for Rocky D. Pietro, and Larry Crawford had the best position on that throw. Well, he had to take a lot off of it because he was tackled at the last moment. He couldn't get his follow through in and actually threw it right into Crawford's hands. Once again, it was Rick Classic, the guy, but look at that. If Crawford picks that off, it's going to be between him and Stapler to the goal line because the quarterback was down, and he's usually, usually your last line. Second and ten. The ball is at the 41. The Ticats desperately have to come up with some points here. They have hopes of winning this 1985 breakup game. Situations. The man he's gone to is Ron Ingram, once for a touchdown, another time for 48 yards, and this time for 24. You know, the knock against Hobart early in the season was that as soon as he made up his mind that he was going to run, he'd pull the ball down and he'd run come hell or high water. That time he started to run, but had the good thought of running, or the good uh, direction of looking downfield, saw his pass receiver over and got him the football. That shows that he's coming along as far as his experience is concerned. Good judgment on his part. From the 17-yard line, first and 10. Hobart's pass in and out of the hands of the intended receiver, and Steve Stapler had a great opportunity to put the Hamilton Tiger Cats right down to the one-yard line. On this kind of pass, you want to throw it low, but about belt high is ideal, where he can get it, get the feet under him, and run. When he gets down there that low, it's a difficult catch. It will be second and 10 from the 17. Hobart this afternoon has completed just nine passes of 28 attempts. He'll have to run this one, but he's forced out of bounds at the 12-yard line. Tyrone Cruz came over to force him out. So 
he's five yards shy of a first down. Decision time now. No, no decisions now. It's time to go. I mean, the receivers are covered downfield. They're going to make him run with the football now, force him out. Third and five, they've got to convert right now. Bill Stevenson. Just a comment, gentlemen. Steve Stapler, the star of the final in the East against Montreal. Hadn't had any passes, and I asked him what was going on. Were they covering him too tight? He says, no, for some reason, they're not calling a thing to me. Now they've called twice, and he's dropped them both. This is a third down gamble, and Hobart fires back across the middle. Touchdown! Well, they did not throw to Steve Stapler earlier. They called his number this time, and he made the catch for the touchdown. I'll tell you what Hobart did real well there. When you roll that bar outside to your left, as, as he did, normally the ball will go to the left, but yet he turned and threw back across the field into the middle, and that's hard to do. So as you said, you know, his, his experience is coming. Watch, watch how far outside he gets. See, he's all the way out. Now, you should be looking. He throws it back inside, and it's a great catch by Steve Stapler. Well, that's against the grain, and as so often has happened this year, this kid just does what he has to do to get the end zone. Here it is, third and five, and it's a all or nothing at all situation. Normally, it should be a field goal situation, but they got to go for the points. All he does is get him in the end zone. And Stapler made that catch with Darnell Cross coming up over his back, and Bernie Ruoff has him going after. going to see it one more time as he rolls out to his left and as Ron said when you roll out to your left and get your shoulders turned he had, he had to almost come all the way back on a 360 it looked like to get the ball in there but he could get enough on it to get it in there and Stapler who has been neglected all afternoon will watch Stapler crossing now with Darnell Clash it's man for man all the way and Darnell let him get to the inside Steve is waving his arms Darnell goes over the top but the ball is right on the money 5.33 is the time remaining. Steve Stapler, San Diego, making the touchdown grab on a good throw by quarterback Ken Hobart. Let's bring in Bill Stevenson as the Ticats prepare to kick off. What about that catch? Well, let's start an 85 wide, which gives his friends out wide, and I do a backside post. And if it's covered backside, he looks, if it's covered frontside, he looks backside to me. And he looked, you know, at me, and I was able to be open. We just got the ball in by a fraction, but he threw it right on the money. Well, it was a big catch, and considering that for the first half or three quarters of the game, he had not come to you, and suddenly yeah. he started going to you. I know, I, I, you know, I can't understand that either, but I guess, you know, he's calling the play, so that's what he's doing. All right, Don. Okay, Bill, and 56,723, the official attendance at this afternoon's Grey Cup game. And it's first and 10 for the BC Lions from their own 33. Oh, there's not a receiver in the world that isn't open. Did you ever notice that? I, have not, I know they needed to go to him, but that's a normal receiver statement, but he finally got one. All right, well, gives the ball to Freddie Sink, and this is where the Hamilton Tiger Cap defensive unit will have to come up big. They hope to engrave their names on the Grey Cup because they trail by 12 points and now just 4.56 remains in the game. Don Matthews providing some play calling assistance for Ray DeWalt, signaling a play to his quarterback. It's second and seven. Roy DeWald has had a tremendous afternoon here at Olympic Stadium. A handoff to Freddie Six. He's tripped up in the backfield for a loss. The old Statue of Liberty trying to play with Leo Lizard coming through. Well, you know what was funny? The Tiger Cats don't like the blitz, but when they, you're looking at four minutes and some left in the football game, trailing by 12, you've got to go after him. Ezra's in the backfield, and down he goes. There you see, you'll see Leo Ezra's come from the right side linebacker. He's the one that gets the hand on him and just forces him to trip over his own blocker. Well, you know, there's 429 left. If the Hamilton Tiger Cats can generate a little offense right here, boys, we're in for a real thriller at the end of this ball game. You know, they, you know what they want to see? They'd love to see Rufus Crawford break one right now. The Tiger Cats are going to get the ball in pretty good field position. They have just one man back, and that is Rufus Crawford. They're going after the block. Left to Sagley against the kick away. Crawford takes it at his own 38-yard line. They had everybody going.
going after the blocks, and he didn't have anyone there to provide some blocking assistance for Rufus Crawford, and he was stopped right at the 45-yard line by Bruce Barnett. That's two complete different philosophies as far as punt returns are concerned. Hamilton likes to go after them as far as the block is concerned. BC Lions, most of the time, will go into the cover, get, get those people back, and try to get a block for Clash so he can get in the open. First and 10, the Ticats at their own 45-yard line. You see the seconds ticking away. Hobart is going to run it, and he's forced out of bounds by Mike Ray and Tyrone Cruz. He got to the 48. I'll tell you, regardless how this football game ends up, a kid that deserves an awful lot of credit, and they couldn't have done anything without him, is that number four for Hamilton. He's going to be a star of the future. Even in a game of this magnitude today, with all the pressures and all the talk on him, he has still come through and did a lot of things for just a rookie quarterback. No argument, Leo, with that statement. It's second and seven. He's going to throw it this time, and he was fortunate that it was not intercepted. Arnell Clash was covering the intended receiver, Ron Ingram. You see who was putting some pressure on him that time, 99, Nick Hepler. Even with the bad hand, he could be bleeding to death. Nick Hepler is the type of guy that he wants to get in there and play. It's been a long time coming for Nick, and he wants to savor every moment. Yeah, this is what I was wondering why he was kicking the football. You know, three minutes and 24 seconds left. Down 12, you've got to go get it. Well, the kicking team had gone out there, and now both sides have to make an adjustment because the Lions had their punt return unit on the field. Well, Al Bruno has certainly had success. He's three for three and gambles on third down. Hobart can't find a receiver. Now he throws deep looking for Ingram. Deflected away from him just at the last second by Larry Crawford, or it could have been six. I'd, I'd like to see a replay, because I don't know if it was. This is Break Up 85 from Olympic Stadium in Montreal. Well, night is falling over the city of Montreal, and as it grows darker outside Olympic Stadium, the chances of the Hamilton Tiger Cats winning Break Up 85 also grow darker. Well, if, if Ingram could have caught that football with three minutes left and down only six points, it would have been a heck of a finish. But that, as it turns out, now they got their work cut out for them. I'm not too sure you're not right, Ron. I, I'm not too sure that Crawford touched that ball. It might have gone right through Ingram's hand. After that sensational touchdown catch he made, he was really berating himself for not catching that one. First and ten, British Columbia. The ball is at the 48 of the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Roy DeWalt. Lancing back at the 22nd block, taking as much time as possible before getting the play underway. He gives to John Henry White. The BC Lions can now taste that Grey Cup. At home two years ago, it appeared as though they were on their way to a Grey Cup triumph, but a second half comeback by the Toronto Argonauts deprived them of the opportunity. And last year, they lost the Western Final at home to the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And this year, Roy DeWald and his teammates are attempting to make the most of their year. Of course, would not be complete after a brilliant 13-3 regular season performance if they did not sip champagne from the Grey Cup. And you know what Donnie Matthews is thinking right now? He's saying we've got to play it safe for one more play, and then we're going to pump the football, and we're going to make Hamilton take that football almost 100 yards against the best defense we think in Canada. Ben Zambiazzi was hurt on the last play. John Priestner has gone in at middle linebacker. It's second and ten. And again, DeWalt using as much time as possible. And he gives the ball to Fred Sands as he fights to the 45-yard line. Ben Zambiazzi, the outstanding middle linebacker of the Hamilton Tiger Cats, who typifies the toughness of this team from Steeltown. I think that Bob 
Bobby Roode is angry right now. will definitely be angling this thing to make sure he doesn't get it in the end zone and kicks it out of bounds because he doesn't want to get it in the end zone right now. He didn't want to bring it out to the 35-yard line. No, you sure don't. You want them, as you say, to move as far as they have to go with it. The best thing he could, you know, it'd be nice if he kicked it and have it hit the ground and roll around a while. You know, you don't want to kick it in the end zone. What do they call that in Tennessee? Pooch for that. Pooch. Paul Bennett and Rufus Crawford are back for this Luke Pisaglia punt. You may have noticed that Pisaglia kept glancing back over his shoulder at that 20-second clock, and they are going to take the time count violation. That moves the clock to 150. And will the Grey Cup reside in Vancouver for the next year? The D.C. Lions are one minute and 50 seconds away from taking that cherished trophy back to the West Coast. Pasaglia now stands at his 40-yard line. This time, of course, the clock will not start until the ball is snapped. He is going to try and angle it out, but it takes a bounce and is grabbed by Paul Bennett, and he goes down at the 29-yard line. Kevin Ponar was downfield to make the tackle. A year ago, Al Bruno's team went into the Grey Cup against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers as decided underdogs. Even though his team was not favored this year, Bruno and his Ticats felt they had much more of a chance of winning the Grey Cup, having benefited from last year's experience. Well, as Al said all week, last year we were happy to get there. This year we want to win it, and it's a great attitude because most of these guys were there. Hobart is in trouble. Larry Crawford from his halfback position came in and... Crawford did an excellent job of just containing Hobart. He was up close enough not to let him throw, and yet Hobart could not get outside either. I don't think Hobart should be looking deep at this point right here because they're going to be taking the deep stuff away. He's got to throw sideline stuff and have him step out of bounds and try to move the ball down the field. And you know, from one side of the field, I think a sentimental favorite. If you didn't have anybody you're really sticking for, it would be Al Bruno's Hamilton Tiger Cats have overcome a lot of things. But on that other side of the field, Donnie Matthews deserves the right to win this football game because he's had the best coaching record, and they certainly have a great football team over the last three years. Talk about overcoming things. The D.C. Lions, as that pass intended for Staker, goes incomplete. Now to overcome the absence of their leading receiver, Mervyn Fernandez, named the outstanding player in the country, winner of the Shenley Award, and their leading rusher, Key Van Jenkins. Well, Ned Armour has certainly filled in well for Mer Fernandez, and, and I think this guy, Freddie Sims, has got a shot to be one of the better running backs. He's got the power, but he's got speed also. So, you know, it's amazing. Uh, the BC Lions have been said all year to have the best people in the country, and they show it when they lose two key guys and keep them going. 130 is the time remaining, the third down gamble by the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Hobart looking for someone to throw to. BC did an exceptional job of defending. And the Hamilton Tiger Cats turn the ball over on down as Glenn Jackson gets to the quarterback. They have dropped eight people back to defend against those Hamilton receivers. Well, you know, Don, this goes all the way back to the time when Donnie Matthews was the defensive coach at the Edmonton Eskimos. He's always believed in defense. He started his first two years with the BC Lions, winning almost entirely with defense. This year he came in with the help of Fernandez and his great receiving with a running game with Key Van Jenkins, which we felt complimented his football team and gave him the complete repertoire. But when it boils right down to it, the final analysis again today, it's been his defense that's really come through for him. And Don Matthews has reason to smile. Headman of the BC Lions sends out the offensive unit with 115 remaining. First down play from the 38 yard line and John Henry White couldn't go anywhere, but the Lions really aren't concerned. They lead 36 24. And as referee Jake Ireland moves away from the ball, the clock will start to run. 
Yeah, they're not really concerned with gaining yards or anything else. As long as you keep the ball, they can't score. That's all they're concerned with. Roy DeWalt looked twice to the sidelines of Donnie Matthews. Donnie Matthews, I'm sure, gave him a run signal. Keep that ball on the ground. Run with it. Kick it. And let us defend him again. Roy DeWalt having his most successful year in his CFL career. Throwing for more yards, completing more passes, having a 27-12 touchdown to interception ratio, passing for more yards than at any other time in his career, and having a brilliant breakup game as well. A performance equal to his outstanding accomplishment in the Western Final against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. I think they're going to... Looks to me like they can give the Sagley a chance to tie that great cup record with a field goal. I think that's a good move. You know, you don't get the too many great cups, and if you ever had the chance, it'd be nice. This is Great Cup 85 from Olympic Stadium in Montreal. Well, with 47 seconds remaining, Lupa Sagley is going to get a chance to equal a great cup record. A 41-yard field goal try. Don Sweet established the record in 1977. This kick is short and off to the side. It will go as a single point. 37-24 the score. BC Lions now just 40 seconds away from winning the Grey Cup. I'd like to say to Leo Cahill and Ron Lancaster how much I've enjoyed working with you two gentlemen during the course of the season and I think you will agree with me that uh, we have enjoyed this union of the CTV and CBC networks for our Grey Cup coverage with Pat Marsden, Lee Pedersen and Frank Rickman. Well, you know Don, there's been a lot of criticism by certain people as to what happened in the CFL this year but there's certainly the culmination of this game today the two teams that played in the game, and as you said, the association all year long has been a fruitful one, and I really enjoyed it too. How about you, Ron? Oh, it's been fun. I, I love to be around the game. Well, Tom Porras is in there at quarterback, replacing Ken Hobart for these final few seconds, and that sideline pattern deflected to Rufus Crawford, but he had stepped out of bounds. And you know something? That is just another manifestation of the kind of a guy that Al Bruno is. He knows it's, it's important to get a quarterback in there that says that he can play it, that he has played in a Grey Cup game. And here's a kid that got in there for a couple minutes, but he can always say that, you know, he's played in a Grey Cup game for a couple of seconds. And just over on that BC bench, we caught a glimpse of number 52, Al Wilson, in his 14th season in the CFL. He has won individual awards, and now he is finally going to receive that cherished Grey Cup ring. As a member of the 1985 CFL championship team, the British Columbia Lions. Rocky DiPietro on the receiving end of that Tom Porras throw. There's the veteran center, Al Wilson. 14 years, that's a long time. Well, it's amazing to think of the number of great football players that never did win a great cup. It's nice to see a guy like Al Wilson get the shot. Now just 28 seconds remaining. 37-24 the score, the BC Lions leading the Thai Cats. Don Morris swinging that pass out, and Steve Jackson is stopped at the 50. And that takes the clock down to 21 seconds. There was a penalty flag on the play. The last time the BC Lions won the Grey Cup in 1964, the team they defeated that year was also the Hamilton Tiger Cats. BC Lions have made four Grey Cup appearances, and they are batting 500, winning in 64 and 85, losing in 63 and 83. Upside, Hamilton number 23, first down repeated. Rocky Di Pietro uh, has moved uh, prior to the ball being yes, snapped. Will we see Roy DeWalt in 1986? He is going to enter into contract negotiations with Bobby Ackles, the general manager of the BC Lions, in the next few days. And we certainly hope that he will be back. The interception by Darnell Clash. And Darnell Clash has stopped the midfield with just nine seconds left to play. Somewhat appropriate, but nine seconds remain as number nine, Roy DeWalt, will come out to direct the BC Lions for the final few seconds, and I don't think Darnell Clash is going to relinquish that football. 
No, I think that one's gone. He's never going to turn that one loose. Now, you know, in that final game out west that we did last week that BC beat Winnipeg, there was a lot of talk that in the final analysis, BC was going to choke again. There was a lot of determination in their players last week, and it's just another carryover this week. And then it's been a lot of years for them, a lot of criticism for them in key games because that's the price you got to pay for having a great team with a great record, not winning at all. But this year they can say they won it all. Well, some of the fans have moved out onto the field. The security people are out there just as quickly to try and remove those fans. As Roy DeWalt on the first play drops to one knee. That uses up just one second, but this should... Uh, by the Lions with the chance to run off those final few seconds to officially be declared as Grey Cup champions 1985 37-24 the score for the Lions over the Hamilton Tiger Cats Don Matthews the coach of this 1985 championship team he was of course with the Edmonton Eskimos during their reign Al Bruno the head coach of the Tiger Cats disappointed, but Al Bruno can be proud of the way his troops performed after getting off to such a bad start this year, and then coming back in the second half of the season, and coming back in the second quarter of this great cup game to make a contest of it. And Don Matthews is now trying to get over and find his opposite number, Al Bruno, but unfortunately many of the fans are charging out onto the field and the coaches are unable to exchange pleasantries among that mob scene, but I'm sure they will talk to each other later on in the safety of their own dressing room. Pat Marsden, who called the first half of the ball game, is here with me. And uh, the expression, Pat, on the face of Al Bruno pretty much tells the story as far as the Ticats are concerned. Well, that's true. But you know what, Whit? This was a great football game. It culminated a very difficult season for the CFL, but we saw so many big plays in this contest, so many near misses, you know, a fumble that might have been a fumble and wasn't called such, a tip pass that ended up going for a touchdown, just a great, great performance by both these clubs, the expression of joy on the face of guys like Parker and Wilson on with the commissioner the down there right now. And the greatest football fans in the world, it's an honor to present the Great Cup to the British Columbia Lions, number one! Understandably, the BC Lions and their fans are jubilant. They haven't won this great trophy since 1964, but they are full value for it in 1985. They had the best record throughout the 1985 campaign, 13 and 3. They won last week's Western Final 42-22. They are just exuberant and joyful at their 37-24 victory here this afternoon. But it was a great football game. And Hamilton Ticat fans have absolutely no reason to feel ashamed. Their Eastern champions came into the big goal this afternoon. And I'll tell you, they came within inches of pulling off a great upset because, you know, there were passes that just missed by an inch. But I, I thought it was a great classic. You know, a lot of the football fans in Vancouver this year have booed Roy DeWalt. And Roy DeWalt told me the other day, as he told you, it goes with the territory. He's, they boot every quarterback out in Vancouver, including Joe Cap. He said, you have to accept it. Last week, Roy DeWald, I thought, had one of his best games ever in this 1985 season, under tremendous pressure against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. He responded again this afternoon, passing for almost 400 yards in the Grey Cup game. Roy DeWald 
has responded to the pressure in the two most important ball games of the year. But that whole organization has. I mean, when you take Bobby Ackles, the general manager, and Don Matthews, they've maintained consistency in the operation of their football team. They were able to come up with replacements for both Mervyn Fernandez and Key Van Jenkins. I mean, what more can you say? Let's go to Brian Williams. All right, thank you, Pat Marsden and Don Whitman. An outstanding football game. These two teams met in 1963 and 1964. Remember in 63, Angelo Mosca put Willie Fleming out of the game in Vancouver. The Ticats defeated the British Columbia Lions. In 1964, the Lions came east to Exhibition Stadium in Toronto, and Joe Cap and Willie Fleming gained a measure of revenge over Bernie Filoni and the Ticats, and today they win over Hamilton again. Stay with us. We'll go live to the dressing rooms. This is Grey Cup 85 from Olympic Stadium in Montreal. And as one might expect in a 37-24 Grey Cup triumph for the BC Lions, all three game stars come from the West Coast. The offensive player, the Carling O'Keefe Sports Game Star Award, goes to quarterback Roy DeWalden, rightly so. Nobody's going to argue with that. He threw three touchdown passes, was absolutely outstanding in directing that very modded offensive unit of the British Columbia Lions. I didn't have a vote, but had I had one, he would have gotten it. 14 of 28, DeWalt completed for 394 yards. This strike deflected into the hands of Jim Sandusky. And Sandusky made no mistake in putting it in the end zone. So Roy DeWald emerges as the Carling O'Keefe offensive game star. Three touchdown passes today. And I'll tell you, when you're talking about big plays, let's talk about big money because that's what these guys are picking up here. Over $8,000. That's the price of one pound of gold. A pound of gold will accompany Roy DeWald in the Grey Cup back to Vancouver on their flight tomorrow that leaves Montreal around noon. Now let's take a look at the Carling O'Keefe defensive game star and James Parker who has been honored with individual awards as the outstanding defensive player in the country is the defensive player of the game. A lot of people could have been chosen. Rick Klassen played extremely well. Ty Cruz really had an outstanding game. James Parker though is a very, very well-deserved recipient of that award. Well, the product of Wake Forest traded by the Edmonton Eskimos to the British Columbia Lions when Don Matthews went over there as a head coach. He knew what he wanted in his defensive unit. He wanted the quickness of a James Parker. Well, there's no question about it that the guy is the anchor of, a, of what has become an outstanding defensive unit. He played particularly well in the first half, and a lot of people will say that's where the trend was really established. Many people said that the kicking game would be a key this afternoon for the British Columbia Lions. Indeed it was. And the Carling O'Keefe, Canadian player of the game, Lou Pisaglia, who accounted for 19 of his team's 37 points, and he just missed on a field goal attempt that would have equaled a Grey Cup record. But this was the key play in the first half when the Hamilton Tiger Cats bat had moved ahead 14-13 and looked as though they may have taken control of the game. Pisaglia ran on third down. Can I tell you something else? He might have tied that record too. Les Brown was actually offside on the play. There was no flag thrown, but Louis Pisaglia I mean, I'm so glad to see him win an award because he's been so outstanding. Let's go to Steve Armitage. Thank you very much, Pat. I'm here with Roy DeWall. Roy, congratulations. You've just had a swing out of the old mug. How did it taste? It tastes real sweet, I tell you. It's been a long year. First and foremost, I thank God for being here because it's, it's been a rough year in spite of everything. We, we hung together. We hung tight. Uh, <laughs> We hung tight, we hung in there. I took a lot of criticism this year. We did a lot of good things. I thank God for it. I, I owe it to all these guys here for, for hanging with me, for sticking with me. Here we are, we won the cup. Was there a turning point in this one for you, Roy? I, I don't know. I, I can't, I, it's been so, I don't know when the turning point was. When Jim caught that last touchdown, I thought we had a pretty good chance of winning again, and thank God we got it. Do you think the fans will cheer you on at BC Play Stadium? It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. We got the cup. We got something we've been wanting to get all year long, and I'm just grateful that we're here. I'm grateful that we got it, and again, I thank God for it. 
this will get you a good contract, I would suspect, from Bobby Ackles. Well, you know, I want to stay in BC because I am established in this league and I know the Canadian game and I've I've told, you know, my agent that if we can work out some, I'd be more than happy to stay here, but if we can't work out none, then I, I may have to wear one of those orange jackets. I don't know. <laughs> Anytime. Roy DeWalt, the offensive game star. Let's go over to Bill Stevenson, who's standing by the defensive game star. The Carly O'Keefe defensive game star. And I speak with James Quick Parker. James, this is your trophy. James, this is your fourth Grey Cup. Is it any sweeter than the ones you have? Oh, the definitely. Eskimos? You know, this is this is the ones before was great. This one right here is now, and we worked real hard for the last couple of years. I've been here, and it's great. You know, it's a great bunch of guys, and I couldn't think of a no better city to do it for than Vancouver. Did you have a feeling that your season would not be successful if you had not won this game, the Grey Cup? Uh. No, this, well, this is the ultimate game in uh, Canadian football, and it sort of does capture your season if you can go 13 and three, but win the West Center Final. You had been so close, so James. Yeah, and yet, totally. If you hadn't have got it, it really would have been a lot. Tough. Yeah, it would have been. It would have been tough trying to get over this season and then go to next year, and then we have to try to work for it again because the guys got close in uh, in '83. So this year we try to keep a business type uh, attitude all week and just. Come and work hard. Now, let me ask you this. Is this a better defense than the great defense that you played with, with Edmonton Eskimos? Uh, it's a different kind of a defense. Uh, we run different things. I think the defense that we had when we was at Edmonton is just outstanding. I think, and the defense that we're playing with now is a different type of personnel, so it's really hard to compare. But right now, this is the defense because this is the one that won the great cap. Well, you certainly had Ken Hobart and the Hamilton Tiger Cats defense. Uh, we were we were definitely trying to keep him contained. We figured we couldn't totally shut him down, but we figured we could just contain him 50 percent of the time. The guys in the back could do their job and get the offense the ball. James Quick Parker, congratulations! Thank you. The Carlingo Keith defensive player of the game, and here's the gentleman, Louis Pasagli, who is the Canadian Carlingo Keith game star. Take it away, Steve. Thank you, Bill. Ten years in the league, Louis. This is it. This is a special moment. This is a team game. Uh, we had our hearts set in it, you know, we came back from adversity all year long and there's always, all year long everybody was saying uh, there's Winnipeg and there's somebody else, somebody else, but uh, we've proven that there's a number one, there's only one number one team in Canada and that's the BC Lions. Louis well, we had five field goals, uh, you came up one short of uh, tying the record or setting the record. Uh, records are important in games like this, this is a, as uh, Coach Matthews has preached all year, this is a team game. And today we proved it. Uh, every facet of the game, we played well, and, and the guys are deserving of the victory today. Leo Cahill said he thought maybe the turning point may have been your fake punt. Did you call that? Well, that's one play I wouldn't want in the playbook because that wasn't a fake punt. Uh, a guy came clean. I just happened to see him. I was lucky enough to get by, and I, and I made it to the first down marker. Louie, congratulations once again. Thank you. I'd like to say hi to my wife, Lo, and the kids, and my mom and dad, and my brother, Walter. I love you all. Okay, our Grey Cup coverage, Cup 85 from Olympic Stadium in Montreal continues after this. You know, when I was just sitting here thinking that the BC Lions lost a heartbreaker against the Toronto Argonauts in 1983, and most of the guys are similar. They're the same guys on this ball club. They've got a feel. I mean, so much jubilation, it would be hard for them to describe. Almost a similar story. They lost the Grey Cup in their first appearance in 63 at home, came east to win it. They lost in 83 at home, came east to win it, and the celebration is underway in the dressing room, as Bill Stevenson reports. It's underway, all right. It's also going all over. Al Wilson, there are a lot of people here very proud, but as the 14-year member and the senior member, you must be most proud of them all. I'm just so happy to be with a team this good and, and to be able to stay here. I mean, it's been a long chase, and... My, my feelings right now are reserved. I, I just want to savor the moment. I just don't want to lose it in my mind. I want to remember every moment. It, I'm just so proud to be a BC Lion right now. I can believe that. This can only mean well as far as the franchise is concerned, too. And we needed it. We were expected to win. We had to win. We got rid of all the labels. 
We had the best record in the country. We took the championship. I'd like to congratulate Hamilton. They played one hell of a football game. They're not an 8-8 eight eight football team. They came in here to win a football game. They Best thought, for them. They thought they could win. Al, how much longer for you? Are you ever going to quit? I don't know how much longer for me. I don't want to put a time limit on it. Why would you? The way you be That's right. Thank you. Congratulations. Nick Hebler. Nick, you have been one of the real raucous, eat them alive kind of guys with the BC Lions. You have been known as a guy who leads the charge out there. Today, you played a whale of a game. Well, I was... I was pumped up for this game. I had to take a few sleeping pills the last three nights just so I could get some sleep or else I would have been fatigued. I don't think I slept the first three nights in Montreal and uh, I know if I kept on going like that I'd burn out and I had two good nights sleep and I felt we played, we had a good defensive package, you know, credit's got to go to our, our uh, defense coordinator, Greg Newhouse and Rich Allison and we executed. We knew if we executed today that we could come away with a victory and uh, Hamilton played a heck of a football game. Yes they did, but your defense was just awesome. Tell me about the hand now. I know you cut it very badly, right to the bone. Oh, yeah, I, uh, and that one sack down in our end, uh, I don't know, I must have got it caught on Hobart's helmet or something, and I looked down, I felt some warm on my hand, and I knew it was blood, and I looked down, and I separated my fingers, and my, my finger almost came off, and I go, ugh. But I almost threw up, but I taped it up, and uh, they put Benny Jones in for a series, and then I came in after that. Congratulations. Thank you very much. It's All sweet. Right. It's sweet. Right. Steve. Thank you, Bill. The dressing room scene here, as you might expect, is one of pandemonium. Just making his way up to the podium now is the head coach, Don Matthews. Don, if you tell me this was just another two-pointer for the BC Lions. Well, when it's playoffs, it's never two points. That's playoffs. And, you know, it's really an exciting feeling for all of us. Uh, people that I'm happy for are, are, are all of our football players and coaches, and certainly myself, but people like Bobby Ackles, who has been such a instrumental part of the BC Lions for so very very long who hasn't tasted the victory uh, champagne out of the Great Cup you know and has hung in there and uh, Ron Jones our president it's really special for those people and I'm, I'm delighted for everybody and especially them. Don you had so many outstanding years so many successful years with the Edmonton Eskimos as an assistant this is your first Great Cup victory as the head coach with the BC Lions how does this taste? Well this tastes very good Steve and you know the thing that I would tell you about that is uh, our assistant coaches are every bit as delighted about this victory as I am. Just like when I was an assistant, I was every bit as delighted as Hugh Campbell was. A victory is a team effort. And everybody, uh, players, uh, management, management, equipment, people, training, we all share in this victory together. And that's what's the important thing is uh, we got here as a team, we played as a team, and we certainly felt that the only way we could win would be as a team. What was the turning point in this one? Uh, you know, that's really a hard question for me to answer. You know, you, when you're on the sideline, you play one uh, game, one play at a time. Uh, you know, it was just a big play football game. I thought Roy DeWalt uh, was a master out there. He threw some passes that were unbelievable. Ned Armour played well. Jimmy Sandusky's big touchdown in the fourth quarter. You know, so many big plays in the play of the defense. You think the fans will get behind Roy DeWalt after this one? Oh, uh, I think there's no question about that, Steve. In fact, you know, in the Western Final, when he was introduced, they gave him a standard ovation. And, you know, when things like that happen, uh, a lot of uh, things in the past aren't important anymore. And, and uh, Roy DeWalt feels good about himself and our football team. And, you know, I just love him. I think he's great. Uh, Matthews, congratulations once again. Thanks a lot, Steve. Now let's go to Bill Stevenson. Field position was one of the secrets to success of the BC Lions in this Grey Cup victory. One of the reasons for field position was Darnell Clash, who just keeps returning those punts so well. I mean, is it just a natural thing with you, or is it something you study and work on? Well, I can say that I can thank the, thank the Lord. It's, it's a natural gift that this birthday players have, and I'm very happy that I have it. And it's going to be a great day now. The guys are having a great time, and I tell you, it's a team effort today. That's how they win the ball game. Darnell, I've been talking to the fellows who were the veterans here, who wanted the victory so badly they could taste it. Now, this was only your second year. Did you get that feeling from fellows like Al Wilson, Nick Hebler, etc.? When you're around guys like Al Wilson, Nick Hebler, you know, Roy DeWalt, the leaders who's been there a long while, it feels so great. Like James Parker, who's been there and know what great is all about. It makes you feel like me and Keith was talking about really the youngest guys on the team, and it makes you feel great. And it couldn't feel any better because this is what it's all about, winning. If it takes this much from May to come to here, I'd rather do it again and again and again. Now you know what it's like. You don't want to lose her. I'm telling you. I like to say a special hello to Karen. I love you. Take care. Darnell Clash, congratulations. Now, let's go upstairs.
You know, Don, I was sitting here watching Donnie Matthews, and you've got to be so happy for him because this guy has been a head coach three years, three first-place finishes, two great cup appearances. He finally wins it, and you cannot be just a guy who's orchestrating great players. He has to be a great coach. Well, he indeed has to be a great coach, and in talking to his assistants, one of the things they appreciate about Don Matthews is the work and the freedom that he gives them to work yeah. in their particular areas, whether it's with the offensive line or with the defensive backs. He lets them coach, and that's what they appreciate about Don Matthews as a head coach. Another thing, Nick Hebler showing us his hand and talking about the hand hurting him. Any guy who shaves his head into a mohawk haircut and shows up at training camp with a tomahawk in his hand has to be half nuts to play this game and can't be concerned about any hand injury. Well, I know this much. I would have been in the hospital by now with the hand injury. But you know what? There were a lot of great plays, but one I think really stood out because it was kind of the icing on the cake. I'm thinking of the DeWalt Sandusky pass. Well, that came in the third quarter, uh, the fourth quarter, I should say, and uh, DeWalt, as he has done all season, has come up with big plays. But this ball was deflected. Donovan Rose was there, and Paul Bennett was there as well as they came across and tremendous concentration by Jim Sandusky to make the catch. Well, you know, Roy DeWalt really did. He used every available receiver he had. Look at here when he hits John Pankratz. And I really figured that Pankratz would be a big factor in this game because they've used so much of their inside receiving core. Look at this play. Pankratz was able to make the catch and get it in deep. Well, he did use all of his receivers. And what is amazing about the way the BC Lions threw the football and moved the football through the air in the Western Final in the Grey Cup game is that they did it without their outstanding receiver, Mervyn Fernandez. This is Grey Cup 85 from Olympic Stadium in Montreal. We're back live in the dressing room of the victorious BC Lions, and with me after getting a champagne shower a champagne is the shower. Premier of the province of British Columbia, the Honorable Bill Bennett. Uh, Mr. Premier, uh, I know that uh, you had very little to do with the victory out there, but I know you're going to claim some credit. Well, I'm going to claim some credit because uh, ever since we built the BC Place Stadium, the Lions have been the strongest team in Canada, and uh, they've now proven it, and this is just the first of uh, at least three straight Grey Cups, the next two at BC Place in Vancouver. This is a great way to kick off the year, is it not? Great way to kick off Expo, great way for uh, the Lions to show that we are champions, and I'd like to tell uh, all the people in BC, some of whom thought they would choke, that this is a strong team, they've got a lot of pride, and I'm proud of them, and, and uh, they've done a good job. Mr. Premier, thank you very much. Now let's go back upstairs to Pat. That's one of the great comments I've ever heard, and our people in Toronto are going to be happy about that. That means when we build the Dome, we're going to be the best football team in Canada. Well, perhaps you do have a chance of becoming the best football team in Canada if you ever get that Dome, Pat. Well, we will be under the Dome for the next two Grey Cups. They take place in 86 and 87 in Vancouver, but this is 85, and the Grey Cup will reside in Vancouver for at least the next year. Now, let's go to Brian Williams. Thank you, Don Whitman. Listen, Pat Marston, they could build 10 dome stadiums in Toronto, and I wouldn't guarantee the Toronto Argonauts would win any Grey Cups. We congratulate the Hamilton Ticats, in particular the British Columbia Lions. We talk about DeWalt, we talk about Matthews, a little man that stands so very tall on the West Coast is their general manager, Bobby Ackles. He has done a tremendous job. On behalf of everyone here, I would like to thank our technical and production people. Let me tell you, they have literally been working 24 hours a day to ready things. Our partners at Radio Canada, the French Network in Quebec, and of course all of us at CBC and CTV. Our executive producer for Grey Cup 85, an outstanding job, has been John Spaulding. This afternoon's show has been produced by Lawrence Kimber and very capably directed by Ron Harrison. We would also like to thank the head of sports for CBC Television, Don McPherson, and my good friend, the executive head of sports, vice president for CTV, Johnny Esau. I'm Brian Williams. So long, everyone, from Breakup 85 in Montreal.